this evening, October 14th. This meeting will not have an anchor location at city and county building based on the following determination by the planning commission chair, which is me this evening. I Babs delay chair of the commission hereby determine that with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic conditions existing in Salt Lake city, including, but not limited to the value elevated number of cases that meeting at an anchor location presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who would be present. We want to make sure everyone interested in the HLC meetings can still attend the meetings, how they feel most comfortable. If you're interested in watching the HLC commission meetings, they are available on the following platforms, YouTube and SLC TV. If you're interested in participating during the public hearing portion of the meetings or provide general comments, email historicallandmarks.comments at slcgov.com or connect with us on a WebEx and instructions for using WebEx are provided at slc.gov forward slash planning. So we begin the meeting with the approval for minutes from September's second meeting. Any comments, changes? Hearing none, all in favor of approval? Aye. 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 And I don't know, shall we go by name or a little hand? What would you suggest, Michaela? Michaela, you're muted. Roll call, please. Uh, roll call. All right. So the roll call here. Uh, Carlton. Aye. Kenton. Aye. Michael. Um, Abramson. <laughs> and Mike. Great. All right. Uh, move to approve uh, as passed. We don't have a report of the chair or vice chair. Uh, we have a director's report. Uh, Michaela. Just 1 moment. Getting emails about. An issue joining the meeting from preservation, Utah. Let me just click. Oh, yes, I do have a couple things to report on. Um. First of all, I'd like to welcome Michael Abramson. A Wait, new planning. Uh, hold on. Pardon. I'm not sure. I'm not sure we got everyone's. Uh, I'm just correcting myself now that I've improved my screen. I see Victoria's here. Uh, anyone else that we've missed? I'm here. Uh, Nelson. John. And John, we've got Chrissy. Let's see. David, Caitlin. Um, just to, just to make sure this is accurate. Does anyone not approve the minutes of September 2nd? <laughs> All right, then it is unanimous. All right. Sorry recorded, to correct that. You recorded my abstention, right? Cause I wasn't present. On that That's meeting. right, Michael. Okay, thank, thank you thank for you. pointing that out. All right, go ahead. Michaela. Thank you Babs for being so thorough. I wanted to welcome Michael Abramson to the historic landmark commission. This will be his first meeting. And Michael, not to put you on the spot, do you want to say a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure, I'm happy to introduce myself. Um, I'm Michael Abrahamson. I'm a, a faculty member in the School of Architecture at the University of Utah. Um, I studied as an architect and have since been trained as a historian as well. So um, I am excited to uh, help uh, this the city uh, maintain its its built environment and its historic character. So happy to happy to serve and thank you for the welcome. Thank you. Sorry about the the name mispronunciation there. Happens to me all the time. <laughs> welcome. We're glad to have you. Um let's see what else did I want to update the commission on. Um we have one appeal. The LDS church has appealed the 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 fence height um coa and special exception for brigham young cemetery we'll keep you posted on that um it will go to the appeals hearing officer when it is scheduled um, the attorney's office is looking at that appeal at the moment who is the officer do you know i'm the not name? sure who the officer is <laughs> okay, for the next the meeting because it's not scheduled yet to my knowledge um which, unless kelsey meeting? you know something i don't know is it for no. the November okay. 18th? I don't know anything you don't know. <laughs> so okay. It well. has not been scheduled yet. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I have another announcement. It might be somewhat confusing, but I'm going to announce it anyway. Is that there's been some changes to special exceptions for additional fence height citywide. 
um, this was pulled out of a larger text amendment and it has been, the ordinance has been approved to, to basically um, prevent additional height for through the special exception process for height throughout the city. However, there is a remnant of that text amendment that has that wasn't uh, that hasn't been approved yet. So for the time being, until the rest of the overall text amendment is approved by city council within a local historic district, special exception for heights still may come to you. Um, but I wanted, I didn't want to confuse you and bring that up but I just wanted you to be aware of city councils and the city's direction on um, additional height throughout the city. Um, the main goal being that the landmark commission will in the future when that entire text amendment is, is codified that only fences within the local historic district um, will be approved with additional height if it's um, a historic fence um, that possibly is being repurposed. So that would not affect the case we're seeing tonight over right. on Alvin Street, but right. it, it could in the future. Mm -hmm. It could in the future. Um, so in the planning commission may still see some fence special exceptions just because they were vested before that code change. Well, that partial code change um, went through, so you may see some, um, but it, I, I think just for this purpose, I just wanted the commission to know where the city was heading with additional fence height. And the reason I believe Michaela, uh, which you shared with me was that it's sucking up so much time in meetings. And right. it seems lo logical to move forward because there's so much other business that is so more important. Absolutely. Um, we did an analysis on meetings and fences took sometimes an hour and a half more than a multi-million dollar project. Um, <laughs> and that that wasn't appropriate use of commission time, city time, et cetera. So thank you for that one. Well, so on, um, yes, one more thing. Um, if you do recall, our good friend and former colleague who retired a couple years ago, Carl Leith, is coming back to Salt Lake City not to work. However, he is going to be presented a Lifetime Achievement Award at Preservation Utah's October 22nd Heritage Award Dinner. Um, and a number of us from staff are attending just to share stories about Carl and just celebrate um, the work that um, he did not only at the city, but just throughout the wider community. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Great. That's all. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Michaela. All right, let's go ahead now for uh, any public comments. Yeah. Yeah. Could I do something quick? Yeah. Uh, recently, I've been past the second Ave pump house down at the bottom of Memory Grove. And if the commissioners haven't been by since it's been completed, I'd recommend a visit. I think that is an example of our process working well. Oh, yay. I know we, we ran public works through the ringer, public utilities, <laughs> and I know they were trying to do their best with their mission, but uh, ultimately I think we've got uh, as fine an outcome on that as possible. And a, a little building in there that if you didn't know what had happened, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't realize how how bad it could have been and how well it came out. So uh, good job to commissioners. Thanks to public works for uh, enduring that and and working through it. So it's, it's a job well done. It is stunning. Thank you for bringing that up, Kenton. It is amazing. That's great. I have not seen it, so I'm looking forward to driving by. Yay. Thanks, Babs, that's it. All right, great. So, Michaela or uh, Aubrey, do we have any public comments prior to our public meetings? Hola. Yes, we do allow. We have a just section. one moment. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Aubrey. <laughs> I do we not do see any hands up. 
Um, I know that's, mm, I do not see any hands up, Madam Chair. Great. I don't think I'm a madam. I don't just say chair. <laughs> All right, then let's go Wish. to public. All right, let's go to public hearings. Major first one is major alterations and special exception at the Elks building located at approximately 139 East South Temple. Do you want me to read the associated script to this or do you want to just dive in? I can dive in. I don't know what's protocol. I don't either necessarily Michaela any help on this sorry now I'm reading your emails bab oh no no stop that that's okay. other stuff let um, me I'll just ahead. read it <laughs> um David Davis of Dale Garden Design representing Property Reserve Inc has submitted applications to the city for a project centered around the former Elks Club building located at approximately 139 East South Temple um, these items for review will focus specifically on major alterations to the Elks building where a special exception and certificate of appropriateness must be approved, reviewed and approved by the Historic Landmark Commission. Um, these major alterations I'll detail in the presentation. Um, the property is zoned RMU and subject to the H Historic Preservation Overlay District. And Excellent. can everybody see the, the title screen of my presentation? Yes, and it does have the um, number of the case there, so we don't need yes. to read that. Just look okay. at your screen. Okay, thank you. Great. All right. We'll Let's move go. right along here. So you know this, you know this case very well. Um, this is the Elks building, at, at, like I said, at 139 East South Temple, 1923 building, um, renovated in 1977, currently vacant, and the proposal is to renovate it. Um, as part of a larger project. Um, the, the overall project is shown here. Um, you, the, in addition to the Elks building being renovated, you would have the, um, the existing garage attached, which fronts First Avenue um, and six historic homes along First Avenue rehabilitated, uh, in addition to a, a new residential building constructed on the parking lot east of the Elks building, and then uh, it, demolition of one building at 120 East South Temple, or excuse me, 120 East First Avenue in order to provide um, access to the other buildings in the complex. So this outlines the, the timeline a little bit. You, in July, you approved all of the other um, items that I just mentioned, except for the Elks building alterations and a special exception that's required for the proposed addition. Um, this was primarily because you agreed that the proposed design of the front entrance would be removing important character defining features such as the tunnel entrance and the front steps and is not was not appropriate. And so you voted to table those proposed alterations. Um, the applicants could determine if they wanted to revise the design which they did determine. Um, David Davis representing the property owners will detail the revised design after staff's presentation. There are some images here, he will show more. Um, to, so to summarize, um, in staff's opinion, the revised design meets the standards of the ordinance and recommends approval. Um, other elements it's important to note of the renovation of the building have not changed and staff's findings and our previous recommendations regarding the windows on the front facade and other uh, conditions that we recommend remain the same. Uh, we did add one uh, recommended condition in response to comments raised by some commissioners. That's uh, condition number three um, regarding the unpainted brick on the Elks building parking garage. Um, it's there on the screen and you can also see it in the minutes. Um, we did receive some written comments from uh, a letter from Preservation Utah and then one other person. Um, those are included in the posted staff report. I did not see any other minute or other comments come in before the meeting. If you have any questions now for staff, I will gladly try to answer them. Um, otherwise, like I said, David Davis is on hand to uh, present more about the changes they've made to the design. Questions from staff or, or from uh, uh, commissioners? Nelson, my one question is on those south windows. Um, 
the applicant the application says that they're not historic. I don't know if there's contention there or if it just hasn't been updated um, on that bullet point too right there. Um, well, we in the we we in the last staff report and and in this one um, cover the we we examined the windows and one of our recommend recommendations is that we go back and look at those with the the owners as staff and determine uh, if which ones are original which ones have been replaced the original ones on the front side um, should be preserved and repaired. So that's condition two um, under our recommendation. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, can you explain, I'm sure we talked about this before, but can you remind me what the permeable coating is? Why is that necessary? What is, so, what is, what is it? So there was, there was this, the proposed, as proposed, the applicants um, have proposed um, painting the brick or uh, coloring the brick in some way on that. It's a, it's a non-contributing building. It was built in the late seventies um, parking garage. Um, okay. There were some comments raised about painting brick and how it's not good for the material uh -huh. uh, and not good for the building. So um, I, we put that in just so that we can work through that issue after hopefully the the project has been approved and and they'll come back with something that would allow the vapor to go um, inside the brick to exit through the paint which paint typically doesn't do great thank you for explaining that any other questions commissioners do we have the applicant we do and it, the floor is yours Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, appreciate your time and efforts tonight. I know you all volunteer your time, and we've been here uh, three previous times, two work sessions and one motion meeting. There's quite a bit to get through on this interesting redevelopment. Um, and we've been the beneficiary of a lot of hard work of staff uh, over the last six or seven months, when, and we want to say thank you to them. Uh, we believe that we are down to um, a review of some of the last details tonight, and we're happy to explain what those um, design changes and details are uh, to see if this meets your expectation. In the July 15th uh, landmarks hearing, uh, we heard from all the commissioners uh, concerns about the front entry and the stair assembly uh, tunnel in the berm that's currently there. We also heard from Representative uh, Dr. Amit from Preservation Utah and his desire to uh, see the stair assembly remain. Uh, we took the opportunity uh, after being tabled in July to um, meet with Dr. Amit and their group at Preservation Utah one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, over the course of two face-to-face -face meetings and back and forth via email and phone calls to try to work out a solution that they believe also would uh, be best for the neighborhood and best for the city, which we concur with. And that's what we're gonna show you here tonight. The unfortunate part of the early part of this meeting was that Dr. Amit wanted to speak and follow up with his comments, but he couldn't get in before the public hearing portion um, closed. So. It's an open question about whether or not the public hearing portion could be opened up briefly, let him speak, as I see he's on here now, uh, and then close it back up, or do you want us to just continue to move forward? You're muted, Babs. Any questions for the applicant? Hearing none, do we have any questions or comments from the public? Yes, we have Dr. Amit is on right now. And can I can I be heard? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so uh, I appreciate you opening this up um, as I've already been identified I'm from Preservation Utah. 
And uh, as always, I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the organization and its constituency. Um, in mid-September, I wrote to the uh, planning division a letter of support on behalf of the Elks Building Project before all of you tonight. It sounds like you did receive that letter in your packets. Uh, that letter outlines why Preserva Preservation Utah supports the version of the Elks Building Project before you. And rather than repeat the content of that letter, I'm just going to explain to you how it came about. And this is something that, uh, that David has already referred to. Um, the last time, of course, the Elks Building came up for review uh, by this commission. Uh, we spoke out against the Elks Building proposal <clears throat> that at that time was on the table. Um, and as all of you remember, our comments focused primarily on the proposed removal of the building's berm and staircase. Uh, as David explained, since that time, uh, we have met uh, a variety of occasions with PRI and through the vigorous conversations that occurred at those meetings, uh, both sides, uh, Preservation Utah and PRI, and their team came to a solution that uh, we feel acknowledged preservation as well as uh, the developers' desires to make this a 21st century office space. Uh, we very much appreciate the dialogue we had with PRI. We enjoyed those interactions. Uh, in the end, we really do think that this is a solution that represents both the developer's interests as well as those of the preservation community. And for this reason, we ask all of you commissioners, landmark commissioners, to greenlight this project and allow it to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, doctor. Any additional person wanting to speak? Do we have any other public comments? Just one moment. Absolutely. I can only see your face, Michaela. Should we be seeing the speaker's face? Um, I called on him. I called on um, David from the attendees list. Oh, that's I don't that see works. any other hands up to speak to this. Just one. Um, my hand is up. This is Michael. Oh, uh, hi, Michael. Hi. Um, I have a question for the. I guess the representative of the, of the design group. <laughs> um, I, I think, first of all, I think the, the solution is, is, is really elegant and I think it'll really improve the, the South Temple um, corridor. Um, but I guess I, I, I have one question regarding um, materials that uh, the sort of beige stone that, that frames the, the windows sort of up above um, that berm currently, uh, do you have any concerns about whether or not you'll be able to match that on the lower part that's going to be exposed um, by the removal of that berm? And if you know if you have thoughts on on how you're going to do that, um, I'd appreciate hearing them. Thank you, Commissioner. I don't think we have uh, that much concern at this point. We haven't reached out to who we believe is the original producer of that glazed terracotta. The base of this building uh, is actually cast in place concrete underground, and then there's a veneer of granite, uh, almost a, a, a flamed or a, a rough granite. That's a veneer right below the surface of the platform. And then sitting on top of that granite is the glazed terracotta that we believe came from uh, Gladie McBean in California. And we do see that same terracotta in a color um, and pattern, glaze pattern, still being produced. So it gives us some confidence that we'll be able to match that. We have the ability to match profiles based on what's out there. So from a profile, a color, and a texture, uh, we have a, a fairly high level of confidence that uh, when we go back to the original uh, supplier that will be able to reproduce that. Um, all promises uh, are taken with, you know, some reservation because we just don't know for sure yet, but it's not an unusual material. It's still being produced. We don't have to resurrect an old process to get at it. It's still being produced for new buildings. As a matter of fact, we think we're going to use it for other parts of the redevelopment as a tie back to this building. That's great. Any other questions of the applicant? Or anything else from the public, Michaela? No, thank you. 
then I'm going to close the public input part of the hearing. Commissioners, do you wish to discuss? Hearing no wish to discuss, then let's go ahead and take a vote on a case number uh, PLN HLC 2020-00816 and 2021-00672. Uh, all in favor, uh, I'm going to start with Kenton. Hey, wait, Babs, don't we have to make a motion? Oh, sorry. <laughs> of course we do. <laughs> yeah, and I can do that. I got to just do. open it up. If someone has the motion ready, they can go ahead. Otherwise, give me a second to find Hold that up. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. There's there was one slight difference between the recommendation in the staff report and the the recommended motion on the motion sheet. So if you can work from the motion sheet, that would be awesome. Thank you. Right, Kenton. Hey. Um, Do you have that? I'm I'm close. So close. Okay. I was kind of uh, spacing out for a moment there, and now we have meeting packets. October 14th. Yes. Okay, so the corrected motion statement, is that what you're referring to, Nelson? Yes, it has to be that. Very good. Okay. Without further ado, based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearing I move that the commission approve petition PLN HLC 2020-00816, which is a request for major alteration of the Elks building at approximately 139 South Temple and petition PLN HLC 2021-00672, which is a request for a special exception for additional height to accommodate construction of a new addition with the following conditions. The existing stone tunnel entry and stairs, including the tunnel entry, wall, steps, flanking walls, and columns, as detailed on the applicant's proposal, shall be repaired and reconstructed in a new location approximately 30 inches from the front sidewalk to allow space to plant a hedge and complementary landscaping. Excellent. We got three more. No, that's remaining, right. remaining original historic windows on the south front facade shall be preserved and repaired. The applicants will work with planning staff to determine what windows shall be retained. Three, a permeable coating or other appropriate finish shall be used on the unpainted masonry of the non-contributing parking garage connected to the Elks building. Four, approval of all final design details including specific direction expressed by the commission, shall be delegated to planning staff. So that closes the motion. Excellent, do we have a second? I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, all right, so we will go here uh, to vote. Let's just do roll call here, Kenton. Aye. John. Aye. Victoria. Aye. Mike. Uh, I had previously recused myself, so I'm not oh, voting. That's true. On this Sorry, side. thank you very much. Uh, Michael. Aye. Carlton. Aye. The motion passes. Congratulations. And we look forward to seeing the newly restored Elks building. All right. Yeah. Yes. We appreciate your time. Aiden yes. Lily has now joined the meeting, so she will be able to participate in the following um, items. Who has? I can't see. My screen doesn't show everybody. Aiden Lily. Aiden, great. Well, welcome, Aiden. Uh, yes. All right. Yes. Beth, do you want to click on? There's like a little layout button. I know it doesn't seem to change on mine. It's not changing. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Well, I'll work, I'll play with that. Let's go ahead and go forward with uh, number two here. Minor alteration re-roof at approximately 1024 East 1st Avenue. Chrissy is the staff contact. So, Chrissy, why don't you go ahead and introduce this? Hi. Chrissy, I'm giving you permissions right now. It may take a second. There you okay. go. Sorry. Hi, about Chrissy. That. Hi, good evening. Okay. 
Okay, and you should be able to see my screen now. Mm -hmm. So this is a request by Dynamic Roofing and Construction representing the property owners to approve an already constructed re-roof request. The matter is be being referred to the Historic Landmark Commission for a decision because staff concludes that the re-roof does not comply with the standards of review. The property is located in the avenues and the building is considered a contributing structure to the character and integrity of the avenues local historic district. This proposal is to replace the existing roofing with a certainty carriage house shingles um, in the color brownstone. This is a photo provided from the roof of the structure after the work was completed. The work was carried out without a certificate of appropriateness and the decision is now being referred to the commission because staff concludes that the Fox, the fake shadow um, design does not comply with the standards of review and adversely affects the historic district. Here are current photos um, taken from the sidewalk and to be a, a disclaimer, I did have to hold my phone up because it is quite a tall house. So my phone was up in the air to get these photos just for complete accuracy. <laughs> so for background, the reconnaissance level survey for the Avenues Historic District indicates that the building was constructed in 1892. The historic Victorian home is an example of pattern book design. Many of the home's original details were removed or covered when the house was sited with the best of shingles, probably in the 1950s, according to the survey. The applicant indicated that they replaced two layers of asphalt shingles on the roof. While the asphalt shingles are generally an appropriate replacement material for most roofs, the design of the proposed shingles in this instance mimics a more dimensional shingle, such as a slate shingle or cedar. The city's adopted historic guidelines and zoning ordinance discourage imitation materials designed to look like other materials, which create a false sense of history and architecture. Additionally, the historic guidelines are specific in that shingle shape and character should be similar to the original form. So based on the analysis and findings outlined in your staff report, staff recommends that the commission deny the request because it does not meet standards two and three. But that is my presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions right now. The applicant is also on the line. Proceed. The only oh, go ahead. Uh, Joe and Kim Bell. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Okay, hearing none, do we have the applicant? Joe and Kim, this is Michaela from Planning. I'm not able to pop you over into the panelist list, but I have unmuted you. Okay, but we do have a presentation. I guess we're not able to share that then. Yeah, we should be able to. How do we share the presentation? Is it possible that you email it to us? WebEx is not letting us. I'm not sure what sort of device you you're using, but well, no, reason. because we received a link that didn't work, and then we had to get a new link that was only as an attendee. For some reason, we weren't we were provided a link as a panelist. And that didn't work. So now we're not having the ability to give our presentation. I, I'm sorry, but that's we, we need to be able to do that. Uh, is it possible that you can email it to us and we can pull up your presentation and walk you through it, sir? I, I guess. I mean, if that's our only option, let me see if we can hurry and email it off. Do you want to continue with another one and then put us number three and we'll email that to you? Yeah, I don't oh, think sure. that's a problem. Is that okay? Can I ask a quick question of staff? Uh, if we deny, if we uh, deny the certificate of appropriateness, is the resolution a full re-roofing? Yes, they would need to comply with um, the standards. Okay. So well, let's just want to email that to me. I'm, I'm emailing it to Chrissy because I have your email. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. that would That'd be wonderful. Thank you. Thank Why don't we pause that one for just a moment? I'm sure the public doesn't have an issue with that either, seeing that it's just a technical blip for a moment. So why don't we go, uh, do, do we have the, um, the uh, applicant for number three available so that we can go to number three? Do you see them? Yes. I see them and I can make them a panelist. All right, great. So More this is, uh, we're going to move on to number three right now, minor alteration, faux slate re-roof at approximately 474 East, a second Avenue. The staff is Michael and is Michael there for us? Yes, I'm here. 
All right, why don't you go ahead and introduce this one? And this <laughs> is case number PLNHLC 2021-00668. Thank you to you, Chair. Um, so this is a request by Moises Cook, um, representing the property owner, to remove the existing asphalt shingles on the home at 474 East 2nd Avenue and replace them with composite slate shingles. Um, the applicant is also requesting to re-roof the detached garage, which is located in the rear yard with architectural shingles. Uh, the home is located on the south side of 2nd Avenue in between F and G streets. The 20th Ward LDS Meeting House is located directly across the street to the north. Um, the home is located in the Avenue's local historic district and is identified as a contributing structure to the district. It was originally constructed in 1888 and is Victorian eclectic in style. Um, the main portion of the house has a mansard style roof. Um, there is a rear addition and covered porch with a shed style roof that the applicant is not requesting to re-roof at this time. Uh, the homeowner would like to completely rebuild the rear addition um, at some point in the future. Um, the request is to remove the current asphalt shingles and replace them with faux slate um, in a dark neutral color. The applicant would also like to install a new TPO membrane on the flat portion of the mansard roof and add copper trim around the flat portion and along the drip edge. The detached garage currently has asphalt shingles and the applicant would like to replace these with asphalt architectural shingles. Typically a re-roof application uh, would be approved at the staff level but this application was referred to the Historic Landmark Commission because faux slate is not a material that can be approved administratively. So there are a couple of key issues to consider with this proposal. Uh, the first is that the roof is a character defining feature of the home and it is highly visible from the public way. Um, in addition, mansard style roofs are relatively uncommon in the context of the avenues. So this home is slightly unique in that regard. Uh, the roof structure and form are original to the structure. Um, the second issue is that if approved, this proposal would introduce a faux uh, roofing material. Um, 1898 and 1911 Sanborn maps indicate that the historic roofing materials were wood, tin, and possibly real sleet. Um, the 1950s Sanborn map indicates that the roof material had been switched to composition. And a Salt Lake County archives photo from 1982 appears to show asphalt shingles. Um, it is possible that one of the historic roofing materials was real slate. Um, however, even if that were the case, the applicant is proposing to use a faux slate, which is made to resemble a historic material. Um, this would create a false sense of history by introducing a type of roofing material that is not typically associated with the style and age of home um, on a contributing structure within a local historic district. Therefore, the recommendation of staff is to deny the applicant's request. Um, staff would recommend the homeowner use an architectural asphalt shingle instead. Um, and more detail about how the applicant, how the application is failing to comply with the standards for a minor alteration can be found in attachment F in the staff report. Excellent. Do answer any questions? Commissioners have any questions for Michael? Hearing none. I've got a I'm oh. sorry, uh, Babs, I got a quick question. Okay. Um, there, the the re-roofing of the flat portion with the copper trim is not at issue, correct? Um, staff is not raising an issue with that, no. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, Michael, you say that this is uh, a lone example of a mansard roof in this historic district. Are there... Other mansard roofs in the city, like what's the one down at the Triad Center? Is that Devereaux? Does that Devereaux have... Mansion? Yes. What's the, the roofing on that one? What's the roofing on other mansards in Utah or other places in the country? Or you no, know, what's on a mansard roof in Paris? <laughs> I mean, seriously, what's 
you know, how, do, how are Mansard's roofs seized uh, nationally and internationally? We also uh -huh. have a lot of them in Salt Lake, but more towards the Cottonwood Heights uh, holiday area. I show them all the time and they are all asphalt shingles. Um, and I should also note that um, and we didn't determine that this was the only Mansard style in the avenues. It's just um, okay. one common. Um, and as far as looking at how other Mansards are, are roofed, that, that wasn't looked at as part of the scope of this application. So I'm not sure that I have an answer. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Let's hear from the applicant. I hope you can hear me. I am Shannon Young. I'm the owner of the home. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Thanks for um, taking the case with us. I wish I could have done a presentation. Um, the idea is to make it look more historic. I know it's a synthetic product that we're we're um, planning on using. Um, with that, there are there is a Mansard style roof in the avenues. It does have real slate. I would have loved to have done real slate. It's out of the budget on that. It's just to enhance the look of more of a Mansard style, which, in my opinion, from what I've seen, is very appropriate with the slate look. It is a very good um, composite shingle that is 100% recyclable with a 50 year lifespan. I don't know what else to say on it. I was just hoping that. I thought it would look historically appropriate, even though it is synthetic, but at one point. Asphalt wasn't historically appropriate either. Do we have any questions of the applicant? What exactly is the proposed product for the post slate? It's the Da Vinci style composite resin slate. It's in the um, European color range. It's just like a, a kind of a, it's a mixed gray colored slate, imitation slate. Any other questions? Thank you, Shannon. Uh, we'll continue to see if the public has any input or questions. Michaela? Can't hear you. I do not see. I'm here. I'm here. I do not see anyone on the line. Thank you. Thank Babs, you. Babs, I just thought of a question for the owner, if possible. Sure. Um, Ms. Young, uh, when you say that you thought it would look more historically appropriate. Can you um, describe what informs that opinion? What sort of research you have or examples? So because, it, oh, sorry. Because it is a Mansard style roof, if you look at a lot of the roofs done in Europe that are a Mansard style, they're done in a slate shingle. Like I, I would love to do a slate. It's too, it weighs too much to do on the roof without um, significant reconfiguration of it. And the look of it with the copper accents is all over Mansard style roofs from the 1880s throughout Europe. Any other questions? Uh, we do have a hand up. Okay. Cindy Cromer. Cindy Cromer. Hi, er hi everybody. I just want to clarify the um, Mansard roof that has slate on it has been before the commission before in the past. And that slate is not original to the house. It was a salvaged material, and that was an issue when it was before the commission. It was quite some years ago. Um, it's, I'm just trying to clarify what would be in the record, not taking a position on this particular application. But the other house in the lower avenues did not originally have slate. Mm. It's an answered Thank roof. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cindy. We appreciate your historical knowledge. I, I'm sorry, I should have clarified that. I was where it got replaced in the 1980s and it was taken from the Cathedral of the Madeline. So I apologize, I didn't mean to misrepresent that. And that's not a problem. Any other questions? Yeah, please. Um, <clears throat> Michael or someone, perhaps it said this in report, I don't remember seeing it. Uh, what 
do you speculate, speculate the original roofing material was when this house was constructed? So the, um, the 1898 Sanborn um, indicates wood and possibly tin. So I, hmm. our thought was that it was probably cedar shake um, and then ultimately became uh, asphalt shingles by, by the 80s, so. Okay, great, thanks, Michael. Well, and my question is, have we ever allowed this kind of material on a roof in the avenues before? Not intentionally is my understanding. Hmm. All right. All right, well, I'm going to close the time for public questions, comments, and have the commissioners discuss. May I ask a quick question? My roofer is trying to make a comment. His name is Moses. His hand is up, but he can't make a comment. Well, Moses, we want to hear from you. Michaela, how are we going to do this? Moses is in the panelist list. Moses, you can just unmute and mute yourself. Okay. Uh, can you let's see? Can you hear me right now? Yes, yes sir. Oh, great, great. Oh, all right. Uh, my name is Moses. I'm uh, the contractor for um, uh, Sharon Young. Uh, I'm a, we are B100 contractor. Um, I have a comment to make actually on the synthetic slate roof. The reason we're actually also using this is because the structure of the building, as you probably know, is actually is not sound to use the real slate tile that actually on some of the buildings you might be able to do it because of the, you know, the, the, uh, the vertical loads and so on. So on this situation, I as a contractor, we all we propose to use the synthetic slate roof tile, which actually would be uh, a better for, you know, for, um, uh, for safety, for, um, you know, seismic activities and so on, would be actually the way uh, product to use instead of using the real slate. Uh, another um, item that I wanted to talk about that I actually talked to uh, the property owner is the other building that is actually on 78 North on I Street. It does have the composite um, slate roof um i understand it's actually it's a heavy duty it's like you know, kind of like a more like a tile uh roof material but again uh that building might have some different type of structure as far as the vertical loads and into the footings but this building right here actually um the owner and i talking about it and also with my background in engineering and structures is the base material to use is the synthetic slate uh roof tile also going back to the previous uh, materials used in the past uh, right now, there's uh, two layers of shingles on the existing uh, roof, um, and also on the very top, when we talk about the TPO, uh, it's also existing. Uh, we're proposing to replace the TPO with TPO. It's actually a flat surface material on the very top. So we are not planning on adding a new material. It's just that we're actually replacing it with a brand new TPO material to withstand the code requirements of being a flat roof. And as far as using the copper on the drip edge, right now it does have a drip edge, it's metal, but we actually think about doing a little bit more of a, you know, a color variation by using a copper, looking more of like, you know, going along with the preservation of the community. Um, and that's also all the, all the comments I have. If you have any questions, you, uh, I'll, be, I'll be able to answer them as well. Any questions of the roofer contractor? I've got a quick question for Mr. Cook. Have, have you, re-roofed other projects in the avenues? Uh, not in the avenues, but uh, we have done over 300 houses in Solid County, uh, Weber County, uh, with um, uh, metal, shingles, um, you know, synthetic slates and so on. Other questions? Now we're gonna close the public hearing for commissioners to discuss. Any commissioners? Um, with the Devereaux Mansion, if I recall correctly, that was also a HLC hearing where they were trying to put um, a composite slate onto a roof that was perhaps traditionally slate. There was some debate to that. Um, so there is precedent here. Um, and that was, I, that was before I was on the commission. But I was at the meeting and I believe it was um, denied. It was. Thank you for oh, bringing that yeah, up. Yeah, John, John, you're correct. That, that absolutely was denied. 
it was similar reasons too as the structural you know the underlayment wasn't structurally able to handle real slate and um, there are budgetary items as well budgetary considerations well and so if it was approved then this would be the first example of this kind of roofing material in the avenues if you don't mind commission i can jump in and address that question yes the applicant raised a property i believe on i street as an example of this type of roofing material and that property received a certificate of appropriateness for a simple asphalt shingle re-roof and went and applied these shingles with that certificate of appropriateness so it was not approved by planning staff and it was missed by building permits and so this type of roofing material is not readily approved which is why you're seeing it this evening Great, thanks for that clarification, Kelsey. Of course. So I, I did a, a quick and thorough survey while we were just talking here, looking at mansard roofs, just some images of them. And I find asphalt shingle, I find slate, I find wood shakes, I find standing seam metal. Um, so, it seems like there isn't a a standard way of addressing this nationally and internationally. Um, comes to mind a uh, session or two ago, we approved a photovoltaic shingle to go on a house not too far from this that uh, wasn't going to look exactly like an asphalt shingle, although it would resemble it. And I'd, I'd say, unless we're going to require that the homeowner go back to the original cedar shake on this, on this mansard roof, I don't know that we're being consistent in saying, no, you gotta do asphalt shingles rather than faux slate shingles. Uh, because asphalt shingles are not original themselves. I, I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm thinking I don't have a problem with the proposed faux slate shingles. But you also keep comparing to nationally and internationally, and we're just doing, uh, you know, the hyper neighborhood here, which has never allowed this. Fair point. Any other comments, commissioners? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, most, I'm kind of a long Kenton on this and that, you know, Mansart's originally, you know, the French had slate and that's, that's what they were. And over the course of time, it's slate, it's wood, metal, asphalt, and has been used most recently. The, I, I guess the, the issue that I have, and this goes back to, to a year and a half ago or so, and this has to do with the fact that, that, a, that a contractor, a roofing contractor, you know, in reading in the background, it's very, very straightforward. You know, this application was an initially submitted for an administrative review for a replacement, but the work had already been done. And and it seemed like that at the application time frame, that's when this issue would have could have been caught and there would have would have been at that point in time an issue raised saying, Hang on, this this type of roofing, this faux look is not approved. You've got to use a, an alternate material. And then the alternate materials, you know, would have been probably the asphalt shingles, since that would have been in the price point, but that that wasn't done. So that that's that that's one issue, and 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 I want to address that maybe you know later uh, in the meeting. The second issue is is that this it is already on there, and now we're, you know, and I, I I'm with Kent. I I drove around this. I looked at it, and and unless you're you're focused on looking at this roof. And you notice that it's it's you know it, it's the faux shingles. It it doesn't it it doesn't smack in the face. It doesn't smack in my face that it's it that it's it's uh, it's a material that that uh, you know has previously been deemed inappropriate. I'm so sorry, Commissioner um, Bela. The these shingles have not been installed on this property. The well, they have not prior been. case was an enforcement case. This one is a proposal for re-roof for these shingles. So the 
the, the work has not been done. All right, then. Then I think this is a straightforward. If the work has not been done, you know, let's not do it with an inappropriate material. If let me ask a question of the commissioners, if if true slate was being proposed and the roof structure could handle it, would this still be an issue, or is it the fact that it's a faux slate that we're looking at? I want to ask staff that question. Kind of back. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. I was saying though, it sounds like it's the appearance, not the material, since the asphalt itself isn't original. So it feels like the appearance is what we should be focusing on, not the actual material itself. Yeah, it, it's the false history aspect, Victoria. I think that's an issue. Um, yeah, you're absolutely correct. Um, okay. Both commissioners, you're both correct. We look at the material aspect of a composite material and is it appropriate in the proposed location, right? On a character defining feature, which is the roof form and um, what shape and shadow and line and effect that material would have on such character defining feature. So do we then need to go back and revisit the use of hardy board siding uh, versus wood? We approve hardy board when it's it's laid in to look like uh, horizontal siding, recognizing that it's a modern material and it looks appropriate, but it's not real wood. Uh, where where does this stop? Yeah, like if it was architectural asphalt shingles that are meant to look like wood shingles, would this be it before us, or would that be approved? by staff. Would you like me to address those questions? Yes, Kelsey. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so hardy board siding, uh, we readily approve on secondary or tertiary elevations. Primary elevations, we require traditional materials typically. And so you would still see wood, traditional wood lap siding or shake or whatever it may be that material, even traditional stucco. The secondary and tertiary, you have more flexibility to do those composite materials that may or may not resemble a traditional material, like hardy fiber cement siding. Um, so if this was a proposal for residing on the primary elevation with hardy, we would say no, you need to use wood. Yeah. So we do draw a line with character defining features, especially from the public visible from the public way on primary elevations. Okay, thanks, Kelsey. I didn't realize there was that subtle but important distinction. Thank you. Any other comments or questions, commissioners? Is there, I, I know that we're looking at a precedent setting uh, decision here potentially. Is there another city priority that is being moved forward with the use of this material? Is it more energy efficient? Is it more sustainable and long lasting? Is there a reason why? we would want to create a precedent where this material, given the positive appearance, would be acceptable? Can I comment? Yes, please. I'm on um, it's a 50 year lifespan for the shingle. Um, it is 100% recyclable. It is also reflects the sunlight. So it's actually more energy efficient. So if you're, and, I don't know what it qualifies on the LEEDS aspect, but it, it does have a LEEDS certificate on it. So it's a longer lifespan, more energy efficient, and 100% recyclable when it needs to be redone, which is an estimated in 50 years. Thank you, Shannon. Other questions, commissioners, discussion? Are we ready for a motion? Anyone uh, I have a, I have a, I have a question. Um, okay. So I'm, I, I agree with some of what the other commissioners have said that um, this seems like it could be precedent setting. And yeah. I wonder, um, you know, if it is precedent setting, uh, whether composite materials have an inherent character <laughs> to begin with, um, or whether they're always sort of produced to, 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 to mimic um, other textures of materials. And if so, like, I, I'm just wondering what the, um, if there would be any basis for ever approving this material, <laughs> you know, it, like, is there a, um, 
is there a character that it might adopt that would be acceptable, um, I think is the larger question that, that comes to mind for me. And I, I don't know that I have a good answer. Anyone else? And, and I do have our, our comment, Moses, is that okay? Well, we've closed the public part, but I think we're pretty casual tonight. So go ahead, Moses. Okay. Yes, um, again, this is the, the contractor. Again, also, I'd like to add uh, the, the fact of the seismic area that we are in. Uh, having materials like this actually is going to help a lot as far as the, safe, the public safety. Uh, that's actually like all I'd like to add. That would be something precedent for the future would be the safety of the public. Can you qualify that statement? How does it promote public safety? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. Could you qualify that, Moses? How this affects public safety? Sure. Like uh, in the case of like a seismic activity or problems like that, I mean, if we were to install real slate, talking about like pieces of concrete, you know, falling off and uh, being able okay. to kind of like, you know create some type of uh, injuries on 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 people as they're walking outside on the egress areas uh, towards safety locations, uh, being this type of material, which is synthetic slate. As they're coming out, uh, falling in case they're falling with, because of the seismic activities and so on, it's not going to hurt somebody on the head. You know, kind of like public safety coming out and the vicinity being in the avenues, people walking by and so on. So that's actually I'm talking about, like, you know, public safety in, in, for the uh, switching the materials to something more um, light, uh, you know, uh, uh, versus something heavy like concrete or you know the slate real materials are. All right. Thank you. Commissioners, anything else? So am I correct when I read the recommendation from staff that the false sense of history we're worried about conveying exists solely in the material? The appearance of it, there's there's nothing. It is solely because this material isn't original. Staff. Um, so it's because this material is not commonly used in this district. Um, and it's not simply just because the it's not original to the to the building. Um, but part of that concern is that it mimics um, a historic material. Um, and is the reason it's not used in this district because it's a new material or have there been other other objections rooted in other things historically to using this in this district? Is it is it because it wasn't originally used on this era of vernacular architecture? We're talking about seeing it internationally, but we're protecting the local integrity. So since it most likely was a cedar shake, I'm interpreting that as like, if we were to put the faux shale or shale in general on the roof, one could walk by and assume that was the original material, whereas maybe an asphalt, um, whether an architectural shake or what they're proposing uh, is clearly not the original material. Would that be correct, Michael, or something along those lines? I think I would agree. Um... Kelsey, if you have any additional input. Yeah, of course. It, yeah, you're both correct. It's, a, it's kind of a twofold issue, right? So the alteration of that character defining feature that I was talking about, which is the roof form with an inappropriate material, which is a composite to resemble a slate, which was never used on the roof, right? It's like it kind of circular a little bit. Um, so I can't just simply say it's just one um, clear issue, which is why Michael has uh, identified those several standards that it conflicts with. So, so what if they were proposing architectural asphalt shingles, but they were in a diamond form or a scalloped shape? Would that be approved by, because it's, because it's uh, asphalt architectural shingles? I think we're going to get into that on the next. Uh, yes. The next item. Yeah. Good point, John. I think we're all tied <laughs> in together. Yeah. They wouldn't get tax credits for this project. 
I did uh, confirm that with the state. Um, I asked if they thought it would be eligible for tax credits, and they said no. And that's some another concern of the precedent setting of it. Commissioners, any other discussion? Is anyone prepared to do a vote? Well, then we can just sit here and wait. Well, hell, I'll go for it. <laughs> I'll go for it again. Um, Thanks, Kenton. This is item three, right? Okay. Yes. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Motion. Okay, I'm going to make a motion to approve. Because well, I that's you. go ahead. Telling in. Okay, based on the information listed in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the commission approve the request for a certificate of appropriateness for, for a re-roof with faux slate shingles. I think faux is a, a loaded term, um, but it's in there. Synthetic slate shingles. Let me let me rewrite that. As presented in petition PLN HLC 2021-00668, evidence has been presented that demonstrates that the proposal complies with the following standards. And there's you don't a whole have to read those all, Kenton. You uh -huh. don't have to read those all. You could just. Um, I need to just. just Scan them for a sec here to make sure I can stand by them. You can just say as as typed in the staff report. Yeah. He, he can't the, though because he's going against the standards in the staff report. Yeah. So he yeah, needs so to I'm he needs to refute the standards. Kenton, I think you're looking for. Excuse right. me, Kenton. I think you're looking for items two, three, five, six, and eight. Those mm -hmm. are are the references in the report. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to back off on this um, motion because. Mike, could you could could you do this, Mike? Yeah. Uh, yes, I believe I could. Let's see. Let me let me talk about right. now. All right. Uh, motion to approve, uh, based on the information listed in the staff report. The information presented. In the input received during the public hearing, I move that the commission approve the request for a certificate of appropriateness for a re-roof mm -hmm. with faux slate shingles as presented in petition PLN HLC 2001-00668. Uh, evidence has been presented that demonstrates that the proposed proposal complies with the following standards, specifically item number two, historic character of the Property shall be maintained and preserved. Item number three, all site structures and objects shall be recognized as products of their own time. Item number five, distinctive features, finishes, and construction techniques or examples of craftsmanship that characterize a historic property shall be preserved. Item six, deteriorated architectural features shall be repaired rather than replaced. And item number eight uh, has to do with contemporary design or alterations and additions to existing properties shall not be discouraged when such alteration and additions do not destroy significant cultural, historical, architectural, archaeological material, and such design is compatible with the size, scale, color, material, and character of the property, neighborhood, or environment. Do we have a second? I second. This is Michael. Michael seconded. All right. Discussion. No discussion. Then let's go through uh, and see what the vote shall be. Let's start with Carlton. No. Michael. Uh, yay. Mike. Yes. Victoria. Yes. John? No. Kenton? No. Aiden? No. 
We have four no's, three yeas. The motion fails. All right. Okay. Madam Chair. <clears throat> yes. Sorry. Madam. This is Paul. No, Madam. <laughs> Babs, it's so hard. Hey, Babs. Madam Babs. Madam Babs. Just, I'm not a madam for heaven's sakes. So. <laughs> um, oh, hey, crazy. you. Uh huh. Um, chair. Uh, when we have eight commissioners, I believe we have eight voting members tonight. Is that correct? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then there's me. And then and you. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. So when we have eight members uh, attending a commission, um, in order for a motion to pass, it has to pass by a majority of the members who are present. Um, so in the case of eight, you need five to pass a motion. And in this case, you vote to either uh, push the item over the top or to make it clear that it is deadlocked at four apiece. Well, good to know. So and I'm going to vote. vote. It's so nice to see you, Paul. Missed you. Thank you. Nice um, you. Let's see. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm going to vote yes, just to throw this out into the chaos. So now we have three, three yays. I mean, four yays and four nays yes correct that's correct right. yes. so then what happens paul the motion <laughs> fails either a new motion can be uh, offered or uh, if we get to a point where we can't get a motion to pass then the item uh, just essentially fails for an inability uh, to move the item forward well so basically so, we have we have to ask if someone to wants to change their vote well or offer a different motion. Okay. Any commissioner prepared to do that? Do we have discussion time before that? Absolutely. Sure. Well, I just want to ask the people who voted no, what is your reason for doing so? I feel no, like I don't I'm sorry, Aiden, please. I've been talking too much. No, it's okay. I was just going to say that um brought just looking at this even if they were proposing authentic shale mineral shale however you want to call it i feel that that would be inappropriate for the structure um that roofing material isn't seen from that era in the district and uh, like i mentioned previously asphalt you're easy it's easy to determine that that wasn't the original roofing material so i would not feel comfortable approving this whether it was faux shale or Real shale. So, okay. it, how did you vote on that? Because there might be some confusion. A, a vote, yay, would be approving the motion and allowing them. Oh, wait, maybe I'm confused. Um, you put, uh, uh, Mike put forth a motion to approve. Approve. And so, if you voted yay, you voted yes, approve Mike's motion. Okay. So, so I voted um, nay. Nay. No, yeah. Yeah, no I, I don't believe that the faux shale or I'm blanking on what you referred to it as Kenton would be appropriate and they voted the motion was yes, this is appropriate. Hmm. So the reason you all, so the reason from your architectural expertise that you're saying the asphalt is appropriate is because it's really obvious that it's not appropriate. Yes. Yeah. So it wouldn't be <laughs> confusing to someone who is trying to read the structure like, oh, wow, where did they get the shell from in 1890? Like, where was it imported from? Like something like this, like it's, it's more obvious rather than the, the false sense of history that the report offers. You know, I think I was confused as I voted. I was, I'm in favor of allowing this material to be used. All right, then that's, let's take and a new vote. vote. Is nay, which I was backwards. Okay, well then let's take a new vote. If you uh, vote yay, and then you are saying we approve this request and this material, just to be clear. So let's do that again, all right? Carlton. No. Uh, Michael. Yay. 
Mike? Yes. Victoria? Yes. John? No. Kenton? Yes. Aiden? No. So we have three nays and four yays. <laughs> I'll need a fifth vote. <laughs> Put it over the top. Uh huh. So I should be going, let's see, four. So I have to vote now? Oh, I love that. Well, here's my feeling I'm voting yay because of the pure recycling part of this for me is like, I think we have to, in a way, keep up with the times. No, it's not what the original was. This is one of the cutest houses I've ever driven by in the avenues, and the owner has done a fabulous job. And I don't think they're going to do a crappy job. So I, I'm I'm voting yay. And then again, we would have uh, five, and then three nays. So I'm assuming that's enough to go ahead and approve the motion that Mike put forth. Correct. Correct. Right. All right, it passes. Shannon, you have your roofing materials. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we are now going to go back uh, to number two of our agenda, the minor alteration re-roof at approximately 1024 East 1st Avenue. Chrissy from staff will be presenting this and hopefully we do have the applicants um, information that can be shared. Yes, that came through. So. Michaela, if you could give me the share option again. I am um, sorry about that. Chrissy doesn't know. And would you like me to re redo my presentation or just jump to the applicant? As a reminder, jump to the applicant. Okay. So we'll also have to unmute Joe and Kim from the attendee list. I got him. Okay, great. Him. Yes. Great. Thank you. you. Yeah. yeah. So I want to thank the commission for, for accommodating us both this evening as well as a month ago when I had a uh, unfortunate uh, emergency. So thank you very much for that accommodation. Um, we can just go ahead and jump right in. Um, we had our roofer was on as well. I'm not sure if uh, Gianna is still on. Are you there, Gianna? She might not. Okay, yeah, she she had something that came up uh, due to our being later. Um, so if you want to go ahead, Chrissy, I'll just go through hers as well pretty quickly. Um, she's just listing here the series of events. Um, permit was applied for before the roof was uh, re-roofed. Um, and then um, they did receive notification that it had to go through, that it was a land, historic landmark review. And if you go to the next slide, um, there was no other communications, I believe, until July when they received a COA from staff. And then a week later, uh, the COA was revoked uh, based on, uh, as, as Chrissy mentioned in her uh, report, um, based on the uh, what they consider as, as not meeting the standards. So we can go forward. I think the next slide just shows the actual certificate of appropriateness that was issued and subsequently uh, revoked. Okay, if you wanna go on to our portion now, so our shingles, yeah, sorry. I'm gonna go from our version of the presentation. Um, so our shingles are the CertainTeed um, carriage house shingles. Uh, they are a dark brown in color. This is, of course is not our house. This is a beautiful representation of the shingle. I just wanted to throw it out there how pretty it looks. Um, do wanna say that this is a 30 year uh, guaranteed warranted shingle. Uh, it actually has the two layers. Uh, which that second layer is what is uh, causing some of the problems here, but that that is a 30-year a, a roof. And um, because of the thickness of the roof and the durability of it, that it would not be able to be roofed over. It would have to be torn off if this was not approved. Uh, so just, just to throw that out there. Uh, if you can move to the next slide. Again, I'm not looking. I'm assuming that it's moving forward. We're seeing now the, the pictures of our home that we took. Um, as, as mentioned in staff report, the principal planner in our case told us specifically in an email that the post shadows are specifically discouraged because they don't meet standards G3 and creating a false sense of history and mimicking a historic material when it isn't historic with the post shadow design. And she also told us it strictly didn't, it doesn't strictly meet guideline seven for the same reason 
and that the style and color would not have been seen historically in an asphalt roof. Um, I wanted to mention from our point of view, the term faux shadow that's used by the planning department is, is a completely subjective term and it doesn't exist in any of the standards or guidelines that we were able to find. I understand what it means and I understand the position of it, but we don't see it specifically mentioned that faux shadows are not uh, specifically allowed. And we wanted to stress here, our roofing material is not creating, in our opinion, a false sense of history as the fish scale design for one thing is very common in the avenues and is a term listed in the residential guidelines glossary as an acceptable style in the avenues. And um, I'm gonna address the mimicking of a historic material in a few slides later, um, but wanna mention that, that from the planning um, uh, staff report that went out, she did mention also it's difficult to see in the photos given the height of the home from the grade of the street. Um, so I guess what we're trying to say is, as you see the pictures above, you really don't see the design of the roof so much. It just looks like a roof as everybody else is in the neighborhood, uh, even though it does have a different style. Uh, if we move to the second or the next slide, I um, wanted to say that the carriage house shingle that we're proposing or we have on our roof it is indeed in the Avenue's historic district, specifically this overlay district that we're talking about. Uh, we have shingles at 209 A Street, actually were approved by the Historic Landmark Commission in 2008, list the case number there. Um, don't know about 815 East First Avenue, if it was approved or not, other than it's there on that turret, as you can see. And then 1063 First Avenue, uh, again, it was not approved, uh, was never submitted for a permit. However, it's in existence right there on the same, just the next block over from our home, uh, can easily be seen from our house as well. Now, if we move to the next slide, wanted to stress that that very home, 1063 First Avenue, is actually featured on the cover of the Avenues, uh, um, what's it called? The Avenues of Salt Lake City, second edition. It's published by the University of Utah Press in the Utah State Historical Society, uh, copyright 2012. And this illustrates that our specific shingles are considered to be appropriate shingle material in the overlay district uh, since it's showcased on the cover of this book. So as far as addressing precedents or other things, as I mentioned in the slide before, uh, this style of shingle has been approved before in the past, and it does exist in the uh, avenues today. And again, stressing, it is asphalt material, which is an approved material. Uh, if you move to the next slide, I'm not sure if we changed to presentation two yet or not, Chrissy, I'm sorry, I'm not looking over there, Did we, are we caught up? Okay, yeah, it looks good. All right. You can see the right slide now. Thank you. Okay, so um, we did wanna say that the historic, the fish delt scale pattern is found in the avenues, at least at this address, 73 North G Street, which is again in the same overlay district. Uh, these are cedar shake versions of the, of the shingle that we're proposing. And uh, I believe these are historic versions of it. Uh, the fish scale style, it, this roof illustrates that the fish scale style have been an appropriate shingle in the overlay district in the past and existing right now. I uh, wanted to now shift gears a little bit um, I know the staff report mentioned that we had two layers of shingles torn off. That actually is not the case. I'm not sure where that information was given, but when they tore off our roof, they did find four layers of shingles. We have in block one, the original cedar shake, which was the original layer. Number two is a, is a dark brown asphalt, one of the earlier asphalts probably found. And uh, we're not sure what style that was because unfortunately, when I went and gathered this information, I just had pieces that were left in my attic from the teardown and didn't have full shingles of any of these really to show what the previous shingles style looked like. I just know that there was four different versions of shingles. These dark asphalt shingles were a very thick and very crystallized version of shingle. They just shatter basically upon touching. So they're quite old. Uh, down in, col or in block three, we did have a reddish asphalt shingle. This is probably a three tab shingle would have been typical of that era. Most red shingles that I found varieties of were indeed a three tab style. And the fourth, it was the most, was the uh, most recent version. It was actually an architectural style shingle in a brown color, which is what was on prior to our current shingle that we put up there. 
what I'm trying to show by these pictures here is simply that we've had four different types of shingles on the roof previously. None of them matched each other. Uh, we're being consistently inconsistent by having a, a, a fifth different style than what was originally on the roof. However, we are keeping with approved materials, which is asphalt. We move on to the next page. What I'm trying to show by these, these are certainly not our homes. These are just quick representations. Chrissy, you're welcome to just kind of go through these. I'm trying to say that any asphalt shingle is a modern material and misrepresents what it is intended to look like just by the nature of it being a modern material. Uh, the one picture that shows uh, some of these aren't from the overlay district, but are indeed from the avenues. Um, the asphalt shingles have been used to represent different types of patterns of roofs uh, all over the place. And so asphalt in itself can mimic all kinds of, of historic features, but in itself is a modern material. And finally, uh, what we're trying to say here too is that uh, this is the slide number 14, Chrissy. Uh, showing the once again the certain or the carriage house shingles uh, in different colors. Ours is actually brown, which does most closely represent the color of our original roof, which was a cedar shake. Whereas the red was approved by the uh, Historic Landmark Commission previously, the gray and the blue gray are existing in the same blocks as our home, all, all on First Avenue. Uh, so our color does most closely represent original and doesn't try to fake. Uh, any kind of tile or slate, but merely shingles is what we're emulating. Uh, if we move to slide 15, we didn't want to burden the commission with having 50 of our neighbors uh, come and, and, and be on WebEx, but we did receive uh, 50 or more signatures of close neighbors. Uh, these are actually anyone who could see our home from their home. We went and solicited their opinion on this. We actually used the wording from the uh, staff report or the, I guess, the violation. Uh, and, and we use that exact wording and simply asked uh, our neighbors if they felt that way or not. And we had 50 of them or more, as you see in slides 15, 16, and 17, uh, that agreed that this roof does not detract and uh, does not uh, bring down the historicness of, the, of the, our, our neighborhoods. And lastly, I uh, just wanted to say that um, again, our, our material does not specifically violate any of the residential guidelines or zoning standards in our opinion, that it is asphalt, which is permitted. It matches the color of the original shingles, and they are of a design that represents historic architecture and style. Uh, there are references in the residential guidelines regarding the fish scale, as I mentioned. The residential guidelines and zoning standards do not prohibit the style or type of asphalt shingles that they are, and there is no specific reference to faux shadows, as we mentioned before. And lastly, our research has led us into a previous Historic Landmark Commissioner who assisted with the creation of the residential guidelines. And he mentioned that the intent of some of the ambiguity of the guidelines was to allow for interpretations of certain guidelines over time, and also to allow emerging technologies and advances in materials to help with preservation of the historic styles and uniqueness of the districts. So we feel that the style of material that was used in our roof does not detract from anything historic and helps to preserve the eclectic nature of our block. Our neighbors all agree as we showed previously in the slides. And what I've shown here is our, our little block, uh, all the eclecticness of the homes, and uh, just they all got different style roofs, different colors of roofs uh, and different shingles. And so we are not breaking from that by having a different shingle ourselves. And so at this time, we uh, uh, respectfully request that we are reissued the certificate of appropriateness that was previously issued on July 1st. And again, thank the commission for their time. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have questions of the applicant? I have a question that may be for the applicant or also for staff. Just to reiterate the timeline of events, a, a COA was issued, it was withdrawn, and the roof was installed. When when did each of those things happen? Yeah, I can speak to that. So um, a COA was issued at the 1st of July, and then about a week later, it was revoked after it was brought to my attention that we typically don't approve materials of this style. So that was my error. And 
after speaking with the attorney's office, it was determined that it was okay to revoke the COA because of they had already done their roofing material and they didn't uh, install that based on the COA approval. That's correct from our opinion, yeah. So the COA was issued after the roof had already been put on? Yes, yeah, so they applied for the original um, building permit in I believe January and then I'm not, I think the COA was applied for in May and then it took a bit to process because we were waiting for additional materials from like uh, photos and the project description. Other questions, commissioners? All right, we don't have any other questions. So um, do we have any statements from the public? Um, yes, Cindy Cromer has her hand up. Cindy. Cindy. Hi there. Um, hey. I have to compliment the applicants. That was an extraordinarily thorough presentation on their part. <laughs> I just want to do a little housekeeping. 209A, which was shown as a red scalloped shingle, was an enforcement case. It was a very difficult enforcement case. But um, in terms of the precedence for this kind of roof, I, I, based on my recall, that was a very challenging case for the commission. Um, and I can't pull up all the details, but um, it, it was not something that was approved readily by the commission. It was following um, some enforcement on the roof and other aspects of the work done on the exterior of the house. So that's all I have to say. I'm not going to help you make a decision on this one. I just want to clean up the record again. Thank you, Cindy. Again, appreciate your historical knowledge and your attention to detail. Uh, any other statements from the public, Michaela? Anyone else here? No, I do not see any other hands popping up, but let me scroll up and down. No. All right, well, then let's close the public portion of this hearing and commissioners discuss amongst yourselves. Babs, I'll, I'll go ahead and start this because and I'm, I'm just going to say, um, you know, originally, you know, and, 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 I, and, and I apologize for getting these two confused because I know the order changed a bit, but, but the notion of, of creating false history um, is, is a little bit. It, it just kind of, I'm not certain what the right right term is, but I know that that architecturally, when I look at these roofs, and 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 I agree with Cindy that the uh, you know the presentation was very thoughtfully done. You know that that you know it's it's obviously not wood shake. It's obviously not slate. It's obviously not a metal. You know these are asphalt materials, and that's an asphalt material that that has it harkens a bit to the. You know, to the the, the fish scale uh, style, I, I don't. I, I guess the, the the notion of of asphalt is is okay. It's just not a particular type of asphalt is is not okay. And I guess my I, I guess my feeling is is that I, I asphalt is is not one of the original materials. You know, it's it's not false history. It's just a, a modern representation of, of a material that, that used to be used. And so I, I don't personally, you know, look at this kind of roof and 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 say, gosh, it, you know, that they're they're trying to do something that it's not. Um, and so it's just my statement that that I don't mind these types of roofs that that harken back a bit with a nod to history of, of previous materials. Any other commissioner? Does someone wish to make a motion? Well, I can try, I can try this again. Okay. <laughs> Based on the information listed in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the commission approve the request for a certificate of appropriateness for a reroof with faux shadow shingles as presented in petition PLNHL C. 2021-00605. Um, I believe the evidence uh, has been presented that demonstrates that the proposed proposal complies with the specific um, item number two, item number three, which is the historic character of the property shall be retained 
and preserve the removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize a property shall be avoided. And number three, sites, structures, and objects shall be recognized as products of their own time, alterations that have no historic basis and which seek to create a false sense of history or architecture are not allowed. Do I have a second? I will second that, Mrs. Kenton. Thank you, Kenton. And now we have discussion. Commissioner, yeah, uh, I want to take exception again to that. Sorry, Paul. The, the the motion was based on the information of the staff report, where the staff report was a recommendation to deny. I think we need to to word that a little differently, um, where it's not necessarily based on the staff report, but uh, based on findings that it meets the standard. Sorry. Mike. I know it's 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 complicated when we go against the staff recommendation. We well it is. And yeah. and sir, it, you know, it says contrary to staff recommendations, I get that. And so what what seems to be contrary to me are are the references to item number two and three. Yeah, um, and you and it, you found you found that, that those were satisfied. I I Item number two, is the historic character of the property retained? I believe so. Number three, okay. that's where it start, talks about sites, structures, and objects shall be recognized as products of their own time. Okay, that's a statement. Alterations that have no historic basis and which seek to create a false sense of history are not allowed. So okay. are, it's, your motion is your motion is that it's it's based on the findings for the most part, but you are um, coming to a different conclusion on those things that staff uh, found didn't meet the standards. That's correct. Thank you. Just I wanted to clarify that. No, that, that makes sense. Yes, sir. Well, let's be super clear on this motion. So the motion is to deny the staff recommendation. That's yes? correct. That's correct. All right, it's, so it's, it's, it's to approve it's to approve the certificate of appropriateness, um, but going contrary to staff's findings on the standards that they determined were not met. So if you vote yay, what are you, are you voting, voting to approve? For? You're voting to approve the roofing materials. Excellent. All right. I just want to be clear. That's all. I no, I want to be super clear. I don't want to do what like we did last time. So all right. <laughs> And my yeah. second of that motion stands. Great. Any other discussion? If not, we will go ahead and take a vote. Hey, Babs, uh, let me say one thing. Yeah. Just like with the last one, uh -huh. I, I take exception to the use of the word faux. That is a value statement. It's weighted with uh, mm. weighted with opinion and not, not based in, in historical fact. And that's that's happened twice now, so maybe that's something um, staff might be aware of that we're we're having issues with that word. And this is just one commissioner's opinion, but I wanted to throw it out there. Well, I would say it's two commissioners' opinions. I object to that to that word as well. <laughs> this is Michael. All right. All right. Well, let's go ahead. Uh, I, I, I actually oops. don't disagree with that word in these cases. In this particular instance, it's a tile that is trying to. Uh, or a roofing material that is trying to represent or give the impression of something that it's not. In other words, it's a layered roof with the shadow, which in this case is effectively printed on the tile. So mm -hmm. I don't think that calling this faux in terms of the style or the aesthetic appearance is inappropriate. All okay. right, then. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the vote. Uh, uh, Aiden. Yes. yes. Sorry. Kenton. Hi. John. Yes. Victoria. Yes. Mike. Yes. Michael. Yes. Carlton. No. The motion passes. And congratulations to the applicant, I would say. Babs, can we take five before the next? We're going to do a bio break. It is now 710. We'll be back at 715. Go ahead and stop your videos and go do what you need to do. <laughs>
I need to compliment you on your 
your shirt. I think you set a new standard for the chair. Oh, uh, thank you. I'm chair going, fashion. I'm going for the fall paisley look. There you go. Beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Um, all, we're only waiting for Aiden to have a quorum, so let's give give her just another minute there. And um, well, we're certainly giving the staff a little heartbreak tonight on roofing materials. I think we all need some education on roofing materials. Um, for future meetings, as this may come up. Uh, all right, Aiden is back. Did I just see? Yes, yay. All yes, right, we, yes. have a we have a quorum and we will continue with our uh, historic landmarks uh, commission meeting here October 14th. Uh, in the agenda, we have number four has been postponed. Uh, so we are now at number five, an enforcement case at approximately 1106 East. South Temple and our staff person again is Kelsey and Kelsey is going to tell us a long story. I'll bet. <laughs> Good evening <laughs> commissioners. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Okay. This is a request for alterations to the property located at 1106 East South Temple. Uh, this property is known as the Patrick J. Moran house. And it is a contributing structure within the South Temple Local Historic District. Uh, the house was constructed in 1901 by John Headland and is located on a prominent corner of South Temple and 11th East. The subject, oh, sorry, da, da, da. the requested alterations, which include reconstruction of the incorrect egress window openings, replacement of the non original basement windows and the reconstruction of the front two-story porch were forwarded to the Historic Landmark Commission due to the existing zoning code enforcement on the subject property, as well as the extensive alterations that occurred. Um, with this, I will just briefly cover the initial zoning enforcement case, which was issued on April 13, 2020. The property was initially placed under enforcement due to, conduct, due to conducting work without a building permit and a certificate of appropriateness. The work conducted included alterations to the eaves, soffit, fascia, corbels, the original eyebrow dormer, and the cornice. Additionally, the applicant constructed a small dormer on the front elevation and removed the siding from the rear elevation, but the rear addition on the rear elevation. Upon enforcement, the applicant did work with staff on resolutions for the work conducted. The applicant removed the inappropriate work and reinstated the removed sections of the noted areas. Additionally, the eyebrow dormer was reconstructed with the help of the state architect at the time. As part of this review uh, in 2020, staff approved new egress windows on the north, the east, and the west elevations. Uh, windows on the addition, as well as smooth hardy siding on the addition and a new driveway. As noted in the staff report, uh, staff issued the approval for this corrective work in 2020. After the 2020 approval was provided, the applicant again conducted work outside the scope of the COA and was again placed under enforcement. The approved egress windows were to be constructed in a manner that would have had the least amount of impact on the historic structure. This would include uh, low visibility of these egress windows as well. The north elevation egress was approved to be located below grade to lessen the visibility from the public way as well as the impact to the primary elevation. The windows on the west were approved to provide egress through deepening the opening um, and no additional window width was approved. The window on the east again was approved to have minimal impact. As evidence in the staff report and the slide, the egress opening on the north was cut above the approved location. Uh, this opening is in the wrong location and has caused significant concerns surrounding the stability of the foundation and the masonry. The egress windows on the west were actually cut in the correct location and the window openings were not widened with the egress cuts. The east opening is cut in the correct location, but has caused significant masonry and foundation shifting. On the south, uh, no egress was approved on this elevation, but one was cut. 
The applicant, with the help of an engineer, is proposing an approach to restore the sandstone foundation. I will allow the applicant to go into greater detail on the proposal to address the masonry and the foundation condition. This is an image of the foundation stones proposed for the foundation restoration. Uh, the one is original and one is proposed. They are proposing a match of the two. In addition to the incorrect egress openings, the applicant also removed the front porch without a certificate of appropriateness. Um, the applicant is proposing to reconstruct a similar front porch to what is evidenced in the photos here. The proposed porch is generally consistent with the original. However, there are some simplified details. The applicant is also requesting to replace five basement windows with Sierra Pacific wood windows. Uh, based on the photographic evidence provided in the staff report in the previous slide, staff believes that the existing basement windows are not original to the structure and a wood replacement is an acceptable alteration. The key considerations addressed by staff um, include the following issues with continued enforcement, incorrect egress openings, a significant loss of historic and original material, reconstruction of character defining features, and the windows on the rear addition. Each of these were addressed within the staff report. Um, and in summary, staff is recommending approval of the requested proposals to correct the egress openings. Uh, replace the basement windows and reconstruct the front two story porch with several specific conditions. At this time, that concludes my formal presentation and I can take any questions from the commission. Commissioners. Kelsey, you said the state architect was involved. Was that due to this being a tax credit project or is that a different reason for state yeah. architect involvement? I reached out to Steve Cornell when he was the state architect to have him help with the dimensions and the location of that eyebrow dormer. Um, since it, it didn't quite function as a traditional eyebrow dormer and the applicant needed some assistance. So he stepped in. Why, and I had a question about that. Why doesn't it function or as an eyebrow dormer? I'm not an architect, so help me out here. According to Steve, um, and let me just get it likely functioned as a venting for the, the attic. And so he encouraged the applicant to install the venting that you can see in the elevation. Okay. Um, as you can see here, uh, it was in a, a difficult state um, in 2018 when this Google Earth photo was taken, but there was no venting or anything. It was just open. Wow. I wonder how many raccoons lived there. Oof. <laughs> Uh, commissioners, any other questions of Kelsey? Why don't we go to the applicant? Yeah, this, this is uh, Philip Harvey. Uh, Dave, did you want to go first or do you want me to say a few things? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, in, in regards to the uh, egress windows, you know, the, the saw cutting, uh, concrete cutting company that we used, they, well, let's see, Kelsey, can you show the picture on the west side? Yes, Michaela, do you mind passing me the, thank you.
Okay, so this is the west side of the property. And you can see up above the window, there's basically one layer of stone. And then you have that um, different stone, um, kind of like a, you know, a decorative stone that goes around the, the house. And so when, uh, you know, I gave the plans to the, the company that cut the, the foundation on the, on the north side, they cut the window to mirror what it looks like on the west side. So, you know, you've got the decorative concrete and then one other layer of stone. And so, you know, I guess there was a miscommunication on how uh, that you guys wanted the window to be below grade and, you know, for egress and, and the size of that window to kind of match what is above, um, you know, that's, that's why they did, did that. And that, that's what their explanation was. And so I, I understand that that, you know, is, is something that, you know, is a no, no, and you guys didn't want it cut that high. And so, um, you know, we're, we're willing to fix it as, as Kelsey stated and, uh, you know, make it, make it right. So that, you know, everybody is happy. Um, but yeah, we, we, you know, I purchased this home with, with my friend, uh, Dave Parker, who's also on the call and, you know, our intentions were to, you know, restore this home and, 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 you know, it, it was probably one of the ugliest homes, uh, on the block and, you know, the, the front porch, and I guess Dave can go into that on, you know, on why that was removed, but, uh, you know, I, I do want to say that, you know, our intentions are to fix up this home, to restore it and, you know, to make it look as good as it did in, in some of those earlier pictures that you showed. So Dave, do you want to say a few things? Maybe he's on mute. Have you been the owners uh, since all of these non-compliance and and uh, violations have been recorded? So yeah, I I purchased the home uh, in March. Right, the I guess it funded and recorded the day before the earthquake happened, and uh, you know we we had a few things, you know, some bricks from the chimney kind of fall off and you know some things on the the you know the front porch but yes i mean so the intention when we bought this is to you know it kind of had a half basement and uh you know to dig out the basement to increase the square footage and you know whenever whenever you do a dig out there's just a lot of a lot of things that you you just don't know until you start digging into it. Um, let's see, as far as the, I guess, I guess what, what was your question, Babs? I, it was more like uh, in a bigger picture, like you've, you've owned it for several years and you've, been, and you've been doing work on it and you didn't get permits for any of the work. And we see a lot of violations going on. So it was more like, why, why are you doing that? <laughs> okay, so what, what, what happened is because the roof was, you know, had lots of holes in it, it was leaking, we, we purchased it and we wanted to get a new roof on there as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I guess that was what the first violation was. And, and keep in mind, this is right when COVID was really ramping up and, um, you know, the, the, the city offices were closed and it would take forever to get permits and so we we wanted to get a roof on there before this home home was damaged anymore and i think uh that that was the kind of the the first thing that uh we did so that uh you know the the home didn't continue to get destroyed um we were in the process of of getting plans working with a architect um 
but it, it would it was just taking months and months i mean we we have owned this home a year and a half now and we have been uh you know in constant communication with uh you know the city and with kelsey trying to get things moved along and it it really has just been a nightmare um and you know we have the intentions of of you know fixing this up and and but it yeah it's just been very difficult to uh have things move along in a, a timely manner and, and to get answers i mean just to give you an idea we we still don't have approval on what windows we can you know put in and it's been a year and a half and and so you know now we're going into another winter winter and a lot of our our windows are you know open or with plywood okay um did your partner get his uh microphone working let's see just texting him yeah he was just leaving an, another appointment um well we can he, still oh, he he says that he is muted um he's doing it from his phone and i don't know what you know it might be under david parker as well let's see hmm. if well he can come on when he gets that figured out in the meantime commissioners do you have any questions for the applicant I have a question. What's the need for the additional egress in the first place? Is this yeah, is we, currently a single family residence that's being turned into multifamily or is there? Yeah, we have obviously a, there's some bathrooms going out or bedrooms, sorry, going into the yes. basement. Yeah, we have uh, approval to have uh, three units. And I believe at one point it was a multi unit, uh, a multi unit property. Um, but yes, the uh, the egress windows are are for bedrooms down in the basement that the basement will be a you know a a basement uh unit and is that maybe there's a better question for kelsey or staff but is that a conditional use or is that a no the property was converted into a triplex um I can't remember the year, but there's a zoning certificate on file with the city that recognizes the use as a triplex. So the property owner purchased the property with the intention to remodel the triplex use. Okay, great. Other questions? This is, I have a question and it's more for staff than, than for the applicant. Are, are, are all other, um, requirements for this home, not just what we're talking about right now in terms of, of the, uh, the the changes to the sandstone and the, the ports and such. Are all other requirements, have they been satisfied? Have they been reviewed by the city? Yeah, I, I guess I'm saying, you know, parking, site, fencing, and everything else has, has been looked at and has, has been approved or is that that lacking as well? A majority of the work, yeah, I mean, as part of the 2020 certificate of appropriateness, I approved a driveway. They wanted, they put the forms down without city knowledge for the driveway, and I told them to stop working again. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted to pour the driveway within the last couple of weeks uh, prior to the snowstorm, but I advised them to stop working on the property until we can go to the historic landmark commission for a decision um, at that point depending on the outcome i can continue working with them on solutions to the work yeah and i, I, I just want to say something in regards to the the driveway um you know when when we got the permit we had the site plan on there with the driveway dimensions and uh and then also talking with city inspectors asking them you know, if we can pour and some of them said, yeah, yeah, no problem, you know. Um, and so we were unaware, at least I was unaware that, uh, you know, I guess the historic department also had um, oversight over the driveway, you know, and so 
that that was something that I wasn't aware of. And so that is why the uh, driveway has not been poured yet. And I would just jump in and say that we there's regulatory authority for all exterior changes to contributing structures within local historic districts. And the driveway was included in the 2020 Certificate of Appropriateness packet, but due to them being under enforcement again, exterior work should cease until there's a resolution from the Historic Landmark Commission. Mm. Oh, so my, I don't know who who's in charge of the muting and unmuting, but um, if... I'm un, I'm unmuted now. Okay. Um, I think I think you've said everything. The the only other issue that was was brought up was just the front porch area. The, the concern and why that came down is it was coming down. You know, we had we had multiple pieces fall out, which Phil had mentioned about the earthquake. But we had when our guys with the permit that we do have with the city were working inside multiple times things were falling off that awning i mean there you know it was it you know we had replaced the roof by by the time the roof was replaced the the wood it was rotted i mean it was this is not something that would have been something that we could salvage um and you know the idea with what we're pr proposing is just to fix it exactly the same way it was originally Any other questions for the applicant? Can I dig into that a little? Um, my understanding of the issue isn't that the porch was removed, at least not the issue in front of us. Um, that seems like more of a building department. You didn't have a permit to do that kind of thing, um, which isn't what we do as the Historic Landmark Commission. Um, but you know, we, we do review the design of the, the new porch. So I'm just wondering if, um, I guess if staff, if Kelsey is comfortable with the level of detail in the new porch, we got this email from a neighbor on yesterday saying that, you know, there's, there's this really nice porch around first South 600 East block. So pretty close that based off historical photos appears to match pretty closely to what would have been the original in the tax photos um, and other historical photos of the property. So I guess, I guess my question's maybe more for Kelsey, if if you're good with, if, if you're recommending approval of the design as designed, or if you think there should be more sharpening of the pencil on that. Okay, cool. I can try to address that within the context of this application. Um, it's the simplified porch detail staff found acceptable. Um, in in the simplified version with slightly closer. Um, with the more important details like the, the balusters and the railings that I pointed out in the conditions. The porch examples that were emailed are fantastic and they do appear to resemble the original porch here. I would say that that's up to the commission if you would want to put additional conditions or see this again with a further refinement of those porch details. Okay, great, thanks. Sorry to put you on the spot. Any other questions? I mean, it, you know, I, I will say one more time. I mean, we we, we really want to make this home look like it needs to look, um, but it it has just. I mean, it, this is. I I have probably fixed up forty different homes in Salt Lake City. This is the first his, historic home I've ever done, and unfortunately will probably be the last one <laughs> but uh you know i i feel like uh you know we want to move forward we want to get this house looking good i mean it's it's been an eyesore for at least two decades and uh you know like i mentioned before we've owned it a year and a half and it still looks terrible because all of the red tape of moving forward and getting decisions to to make things happen and 
you know, now, now we're running into supply issues with, you know, windows, they're not going to have them for eight to 12 weeks. And, and, you know, the longer that these decisions get stretched out, just the longer it's going to take to, you know, to fix up this property and make it, you know, a, a beautiful home in Salt Lake City again. And is your intention to, as you move ahead with this, to uh, work with the uh, the conditions of the uh, historical landmarks process and and do things right in in uh, coordination with with staff? That's are you going to yeah. proceed? Yeah, that that is what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to get, um, you know, approval on on windows and, you know, how to address the egress uh, window on the on the north side, um, you know, that was cut, you know, a, a few inches higher than what they recommended. Um, and, you know, my, my intention is to keep this home uh, and and have it for years, you know, down the road, but uh, it, it just seems like it, it's been very difficult to, you know, get answers and approvals on things. And, um, you know, so it, it we, yeah, we, and we, and just, forward, just so we, yes, but go ahead, Dave. We've, we've made a lot of mistakes. I mean, I, we're not, you know, we, there's some things that, I mean, Phil had mentioned he's, he's bought, bought and kept a lot, but sold a lot. I mean, about 40 homes. I probably have, I'm closer to about 140 myself, not all in Salt Lake, but this is a new thing. And almost they should have like the closing and Babs, you would know on closings, but someone should sit down and just educate the difference between a regular house and a historic house. And even with all the experience we've had working with city councils and, and going through permit process, I mean, this has just been something that we just weren't aware of, 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 the complexity and and how much there was an opinion on everything we did and this is you know a, a learning thing that we've learned from and we're trying to trying to fix it you know the second that we found out we were doing the driveway with without the historic's approval on it we stopped immediately and we've really you know same with the windows we've loved to order the windows you know a year ago but we have not ordered those because we're waiting for you know all the details that we have provided today to get approved before we we put the order in and now we're going to be a, eight to 10 weeks out before they'll have windows in, which we're going to have to figure out how to keep working in the winter with, with wood, wood on the windows instead of windows on the windows. So, um, but yeah, we, you know, in, in any of the construction stuff, we have our, our architect here. We also have our general contractor here on, on the call. If there's any specific uh, questions that they've, they've gone the rounds to make sure they provided what Kelsey's looking for and, and be able to present this, but, they're here to answer any questions on the actual construction. If there's any any questions on how we're going to make you know the, the stone look right and any other questions you might have. Great, thank you. I I want to. It's just not a question for the applicant, but I think think a comment. And and I appreciate that that you know with all of the restorations that you've done, uh, you know, historic restoration is is a bit different. I think you you've learned that. And I would, would just ask that um, rather than, you know, David, you had indicated this may be the last historic renovation you've ever done. I, I would I would kind of ask that that maybe you use this information and knowledge that you've gained so that when you do the next one, and I do hope you need a next one because, you know, downtown Salt Lake and, and all of the areas and, and Salt Lake, you know, needs uh, this kind of restoration, I, I would just Take it for what it's worth that, that you've learned a valuable lesson, albeit the difficult way, but but be be you know better prepared to to do the next project. And I, I do hope that you have a next project, you know, in this area, you know, just based on 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 what you've you've learned from this one. Thank you. I, I would agree with Mike on that one. Um, very much so that uh, hopefully that this is not your last, even though it's been challenging this time around. Um, unfortunately, the the porch was lost. The original one was obviously lost long ago. And the one that was there uh, when you bought the property was 
certainly not contributing anything to it. Um, the one thing that I do note is that the drawings don't seem to indicate exactly what type of tapered column they have. We're not going to get the same craftsmanship that would have been the case with the original porch. Um, but the example that we do have suggests that there were fluted rather than smooth columns. That would just be one comment I would make on the details to try to get that as close as we reasonably can to what the original may have been. Babs, I believe you muted. I'll read Bab's lips and translate. <laughs> I'm afraid to do that. I, I want tacos. I think she said just to prove it all, guys. That's what I that's what I heard. <laughs> Babs, if you have an external microphone, unplug it and plug it back in. Michaela, we can't hear you either. Hello, hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Can hear you now. Thank you. Cool. Wonderful. Thanks. That was easy. That's like restart your <laughs> All right. All right. So we're going to open for the public hearing. Do we have comments from the public? Oh, just a moment, Bab. Sorry. Michaela's. We can't hear you, Michaela. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think we'll ever have meetings in person? It looks like you're muted, Michaela. I do not see any hands up in the attendance. There you go. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good grief. I'm so sorry. Cindy Cromer's hand is up. Yay, Cindy, come on. You are up. Hi, everybody. Again, if we went with tradition, we would call this the Mulford House because Edwin Mulford built it and houses are usually named after the builder. But Mulford was so upstaged by the next owner, PJ Moran, that everyone refers to this as the PJ Moran House. And it's important as you deal with this knotty problem of enforcement to understand why this house is so important. So first of all, it's part of a compound that the Moran family owned that included three houses, the house to the east and the house to the south. They were all part of the Moran family compound. And although this house is far more dilapidated than the other two, they are still standing, which is not the case with other family compounds, such as the Armstrong Jones Madsen family compound on 1st South and 7th East, which has been decimated by fire and neglect and demolition. So it's extraordinarily important to hang on to these three houses because they're part of the family compound. And then PJ Moran was just an extraordinary person. He had a huge construction firm. If you walk a dog, you can see his name in the sidewalks that still exist all over Salt Lake City. He had his office, his, his construction company, in um, City Creek Canyon, and he used to have a large parade of his construction equipment, which uh, he sold to the city when he went out of business. So he was a civic minded mover and shaker, very, very prominent. The house would be important for its cultural and social history in addition to its architecture. So as you move forward, please remember this is PJ Moran's house, and he was an extraordinary member of this community for decades. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. I love that. All right. Do we have any other person from the public wishing to speak? All right, then. So we are going to close the public input portion of this meeting and commissioners discuss amongst yourselves. 
And if you have no discussion, I will entertain a motion. Uh, I, I I would be fine with with entertaining a motion, uh, Babs. But I would would ask uh, Commissioner Getz uh, in the in the two motion sheets. The the only difference that I'm seeing is that there there's a fifth item um, as a as an alternate that says any additional conditions required by the Historic Landmark Commission. Uh, am I understanding correctly that that you made a comment concerning trying to replicate? The, the tapered aspect of the columns as much as possible? No, it, it looks like the comparable one is tapered and fluted instead of smooth. The drawings don't indicate whether the specified one is the smooth or tapered, or excuse me, smooth or fluted version of the column. So I would suggest a, a fluted column for consistency. Okay. Would there be any other modifications in, in, that, that you would, would ask for? No, not at this time. Okay, just as a as a as a point of of reference, uh, Babs, it, it 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 concerns me just a bit when they say and there's you know we can't order the windows yet uh, because we don't know which what kind or what which you know what to order. Mm -hmm. I would have suspected that that in the original drawings that were submitted that all of the detailing would have been delineated, um, and that's where I was asking staff is that. You know, were there other things, you know, have, have the windows, you know, the, the replacement windows down low and, and others uh, have have all of those details been rectified at this point. Mm -hmm. And did you get a satisfactory answer? Would you like me to readdress that? Yes, please. Yeah. I believe that the applicant is referring to the basement windows that they're requesting to replace. Um, initially, when this enforcement case came in, they wanted to replace all of the windows on the house. Staff advised them that that wouldn't receive administrative approval and would likely need to go to the Historic Landmark Commission. Um, I'm not clear what the applicant is talking about, if it's just the basement windows that are before you this evening, or if he held off on ordering the egress windows because of the cut errors. I'm not quite sure, but the egress windows were approved um, and then the basement windows are before you this evening and no additional windows have been approved on the property for replacement. Okay, maybe our, our uh, general contractor can chime in, but I, I would, as the homeowner, I mean, I would love to be able to replace the windows because they're rotten, they're, you know, destroyed, you know, most of them are and uh, it's very, very difficult to find anyone that wants to take on that job right now, you know, with, with the way that, uh, you know, contractors, you know, they're busy doing other things. And, you know, one, we would have to pay more to restore their rotten wood windows that aren't energy efficient. Then it would cost to, you know, replace the windows with, you know, new kind of like for like windows that that are more energy efficient, you know. So I, I, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. Um, on, you know, I, I know we're kind of here to discuss the basement windows, but I, I would kind of like to hear what, you know, your thoughts are on. I'm sorry, that's not included in the application. Yeah. So that you can't okay. really be up that's for out of a order. decision. Yeah, we're going to move on uh, commissioners. Uh, Mike, you were preparing a motion and you got clarification. Are you willing to go can forward? I just, can I just have on the record again, how much I hate enforcement issues because it really puts us in a no win situation as a commission to have to go back. And this is the point where people get frustrated with us and call us, you know, all, and, and accuse us of being undemocratic and Really, when you buy a historic property, you are buying something that belongs to all of us. My children need to understand where this city has been. And I'm sorry for the inconveniences and I empathize human to human, but I really do get frustrated when the commission is impugned or when we make comments about it. It's cumbersome because it's a shared history and I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but I'm not sorry for the preservation and the outcomes of it. Thank you again, Mike, are you prepared? I believe so. Um, Did we do a public hearing yet? Did we open this up? 
We did open the public yes. chat. And Cindy right. Cromer Thanks. commented. Cindy gave us the history. Did. Yes. That I'm was the sorry. only comment. Yes, okay. I'm. I'm not sure. Those work that. like fourteen hour days, two days in a row. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, everybody. Focus, Mike. Make a motion. Uh, all right, I'm going to have a motion to approve uh, as as proposed with with some additional conditions uh, consistent with the, the staff recommendations. So, based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearings, I move that the commission approve petition PLNHLC 2020-00376 a request for a certificate of appropriateness for the minor alterations of a contributing structure at 1106 East South Temple with the following conditions. Um, and I'm going to read through the conditions that were in the staff report. Any, any replacement sandstone to the existing foundation will match the existing sandstone foundation as close as possible. Any changes, number two, any changes to the reconstruction and, re and restoration of the incorrect egress openings be forwarded to the Historic Landmark Commission. Item three, that the porch balusters on the lower and upper portions of the roof reconstruction be spaced two inches apart. Number four, any additional details of the porch restoration be delegated to staff for final uh, review. And item number five, it, it, it indicates any additional conditions required by the Historic Landmark Commission. I think I just wanna emphasize that moving forward, that the applicant work uh, as item number four indicates uh, work in, in communication in detail with, with the staff uh, moving forward. Excellent, do we have a second? I'll second that. Excellent, and discussion? No discussion, let's go ahead and move to a vote. Uh, let's start with Carlton. Aye. Michael. Aye. Mike. Yeah, aye. Mike. Aye. Victoria. Yes. John. Yes. Kenton. Aye. And Aiden. Aye. It's unanimous. The motion, motion passes. Thank you very much. And thank you to the applicants. And well, let's see, uh, now we are going to go to 3rd Avenue townhomes number 6 on our agenda for this evening. New construction at 863rd Avenue and let's see uh, who is going to be presenting this is it. Oh, it's Caitlin. Caitlin, are you there? Good evening, commissioners. Happy to be with you all tonight. I know that it has been a, a long evening, so I'll try not to give any of this presentation. Uh, this request has come before you a few times, the most recent of which was during the work session on September 2nd. Prior to that, it was brought before the commission for some general feedback as the property was needed to uh, zoning map amendments. This is a request for a certificate of appropriateness for a new construction of six single family attached townhome units. This is located at approximately 860 East and 3rd Avenue, which is at the southeastern corner property at the intersection of 3rd Avenue and Queen Street. Currently, there is an abandoned service station and the fuel canopy on the site, which will be demolished and removed. During the rezoning process, those structures were found to be non contributing to the historic structure. There is also a sister property at 868 East 3rd Avenue, which has an existing detached single family home, which was built in 1904, and that home is proposed to remain. Facility. Hi, it's Cindy. I've been trying to get you or chairs. Um, I am. Um, off the screen, we have uh, the Cindy map showing the approximate location of the subject property. And then we also have a couple of photographs of the abandoned service station and fuel canopy as well. This is the detached single family home. Um, the applicant has 
received approval for minor alteration to install a uh, wooden fence and then to make some general property upgrades to that structure as well. That was approved a couple of months ago. This is the proposed site plan. As you can see, all of the townhomes have a stepped way down to Third Avenue where they also have a an at-grade patio or a seating area, and each of the rooms are uh, rear-loaded with a uh, two-car garage, and that's drive access and drop Here I have a few renderings. This will be the view of the project from Third Avenue, looking south. This is at the corner of the property, looking southeast. This is the western elevation is from M Street. And then this is the bird's eye view showing the rear loaded garages in the back of the development. Uh, we have a few photographs of the surrounding area. Currently, we've got some multifamily homes and have some detached single family homes. So there's a, a good general mix of building variety in this locality. And I have your motions here on the screen, and I'm happy to take any questions that you have for me. Commissioners, any questions? All right, let's go ahead and have the applicant. Hello, Commission. Can everybody hear me? Hopefully. Yes. Yes. Good evening, everybody, and good to see everyone again. Keep this intro short and sweet. Uh, I'm Oren with Three Mark Investments. Uh, we have my partner Marcus, as well as our lead architects on the call today, Kevin and Brian with Playlock and Partners. We're back tonight for what we're hoping uh, is approval of our project. Uh, this journey for us started a little over a year ago, and we're happy to to be at the stage. Um, we enjoyed the work session last month. Really appreciated everybody's feedback and worked on it. Made updates to the elevations. Caitlin, I think actually the elevations in your presentation might be the older ones, but um, we've made updates to those since the work session. Um, and today we're, we're here with the final project. So we don't really have a presentation to go through. Last month, we kind of went through all our design steps, um, went through the model. Uh, and tonight, you know, we're just very excited to take the next steps of turning this project into reality. And so look forward to answering any questions you all may have prior to the final vote. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Commissioners, any questions of the applicant? Yeah, uh, Kenton here. The only item that came up uh, of my concern that David Richardson had pointed out was the treatment of the little outdoor seating area, the front. Can you uh, address how you have uh, addressed that issue for us, please? Yeah, Brian. Are you on by any chance and hopefully can share um, some of the elevations? Brian there. Yes, yes, it looks like Brian is in the attendees list, so if we can just Give us a second and we'll get him moved over so he can present. Sorry, I had the, had the wrong person on my list as the presenter. Um, questions while we wait for Brian? More questions? Kenton, I, I wasn't at the, the last meeting. I, I had technical issues and I was excused. Uh, have there been significant changes from what was presented to what we've seen tonight? I, uh, I don't think so, I, I, but I, I didn't get a real good view of the the front, I don't know what to call it, it's not really a front porch, but it's the yeah, transitional it's... area that was proposed to have some seating uh, between the third Ave facade and the, uh, the sidewalk and the street. Other than that, the, the whole project looked excellent. It, yeah, Brian is trying to join everybody, but I, th I don't think he could get off mute. Um, Kevin's also on. Um, let's see if I could pull up. So I guess while he's working on that, or and I, only other question I have is, where am I going to get my car repaired now? 
that you'd taken Bobby's <laughs> station <Yeah>. down. <laughs> Couple other options in the area still. Other questions, commissioners? Well, if we don't have other questions, can we open up the meeting for public comment? I know we had three emails from Carly, Ira, and Julia. Um, Cindy wanting to comment on this? Cindy, I don't see your hand up. That's okay. All right. Anybody else from the public wish to speak or ask questions? No All new right. emails have come in. All right. Well, we'll close the public portion and still commissioners. Uh, if you don't have any questions, um, somebody can go ahead and uh, make a motion. Um, yeah, just give me just a minute. I'm, I'm going to go back into the application drawings that uh, that we've got. See if I can get my question answered just by looking at those. So if we can hold on just a sec, um, I will look at that. The and so, Ken, along along that vein, I had some questions about the back facade last time, and those have been addressed to my liking. At they added a little more detail to that south facing uh, facade okay, around great. the corner. So. Let's see. Yep, yeah, John, we did. Our... Caitlin, I have here, I'm forwarding you the packet that we sent. And if someone wants to give me the screen, I could pull it up too. Um... Okay, so I'm giving presenter privileges to Oren. Mm -hmm. All righty. I see it looks like they're tucked behind the wood crab wall. Did, did that work? It's not coming up yet. Oh, maybe something's yeah. coming. Yes, there yes. we go. Awesome. Wonderful. It, I, I found uh, the drawing that answers my question, actually. I should have looked through the document more carefully before the meeting. Looks like you've got some wood clad site walls that have the project address and some planting and then a, a small discrete seating area behind it. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. That that looks good to me. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, Any other questions of the applicant? Otherwise, um, we are ready for a motion. I will make a motion. Thank you. Based on the information in this staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Historic Landmark Commission approve the proposed petition PLNHLC 2021-00567 and grant a certificate of appropriateness for the construction of six single family attached townhome units at approximately 860 East 3rd Avenue. Do we have a second? I would second that. Excellent. All right. Uh, let's have any discussion. All right. We'll move to a vote. Uh, let's start with Aiden. Yes. Kenton. Aye. John. Aye. Victoria. Aye. Mike. Yeah. Aye. Michael. Aye. Carlton? Aye. All right, it's unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you, Thank Commission. You. Thank you. Thank and you. everybody. Thank nice you very much. job, applicant. All right. You. Um, we will now move to, um, oh, number seven on our agenda, new construction and special exception at approximately 245 North Almond Street. And our, who is on this case? from our staff. Oh, Sarah. Is Sarah here? Yes, yes I'm here. I'm passing Thank her you. the ball. <laughs> there you are, Sarah. 
go ahead and do a presentation here on case number PLNHLC 2021-00253. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I think you can all see my screen now. Let me know if you can't. Yes, it's a request see it. for new construction of a single family dwelling along with request for two special exceptions. The proposed residence is located on the west side of Almond Street between 200 North and 300 North. This section of Almond Street is narrow. The right of way is approximately 27 feet. To the north are recently constructed, recently constructed single family attached residences and to the south is a vacant lot. To the east is a group of out of period townhouses and the northern edge of the rear of Trevi Tower, which is an out of period condo building. The streetscape view at the top of this slide places the proposed dwelling in context with other dwellings on the block face. There is a mix of residential styles on the street with historic homes located to the south and then recently constructed attached units to the north. The proposed dwelling is 2,164 square feet. The site plan shows how it faces Almond Street with both pedestrian and garage access from the front. It also shows the slope of the lot, particularly to the rear as it approaches Northwest Temple. One special exception request is for a reduced setback on the north side of the property from 10 to 4 feet. The RMF zone requires a 10 foot setback for both interior side yards for a single family residence. However, 4 feet on one side and 10 feet on the other is the requirement in single family districts and the RMF 30 and RMF 35 zoning districts. This reduction would place the dwelling approximately 12 feet from the closest point at the rear of the dwelling to the north. And so staff supports this special, um, supports this proposed reduction. The proposed dwelling is two stories and 26, 24 feet, six inches from the Almond Street elevation. This slide shows the front elevation. The primary building material on this facade is board form concrete. The facade can be divided into two volumes, one for the garage on the left and the primary living area on the right. Other materials on the front facade are a wood privacy screen over a second floor window and a cedar pivot entry door with side lights. The second special exception request is for a fence and wall that would exceed the four feet permitted in the front yard. The proposed fence is six feet five inches directly in front of the door. However, with a grade change on the site, the front entry is two feet five inches below street level. And this change in grade would get the fence and wall an appearance of four feet tall from Almond Street. And so staff supports the special exception request. And then this slide shows the north elevation. The primary material on this elevation is cementitious stucco. The board form concrete wraps from the front facade and the wood privacy screens on the front and rear facades are also visible, as is the grade change downward from Almond to Northwest Temple. And then this slide has the south elevation. The smaller garage volume is primarily some cementitious stucco, and then the taller volume has the wood privacy screen. There is a patio on top of the garage, and then you can also see the grade change on this slide. On the rear elevation, the great change in grade allows for the lower level. Cementitious stucco is the primary building material, and then the wood screen surrounds the large windows that are generally in the center of the facade. And staff finds that the proposal meets the historic design standards and complies with the residential de design guidelines and staff supports the two special exception requests as identified. And so this is the staff recommendation for approval with the conditions identified in the staff report. Um, the applicant is also here and has a presentation. Are there questions for staff at this point? Um, I have a question uh, based on the public comment from Paul S. I think it's the only comment we've had emailed to us. And he says, we live on the east side of and directly across from the property involved. We would not like a fence over four feet anywhere on the property's east side, which is their west side. Uh, would that be met with this um, proposed uh, recommendation? So the proposed fence, if you're standing directly in front of the structure, that the new structure would be six feet, five inches. But then as you're standing on Almond Street, it would have an appearance of four feet because Almond Street is higher than the front facade of the structure. So that neighbor shouldn't have any heartburn over that? 
It was hard for me to figure that out when I drove over there. So I would just, I'm sure that neighbor isn't here. Yeah, it, it's, Babs, it's a taller fence, but it's it starts at a lower elevation. Okay. That's, that's, right. that's. That was my only question. Um, commissioners, do you have any questions of staff before we move on to the applicant? All righty, let's move on to the applicant. Are you there, Jeff? I am. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, I will say uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be on the commission's review tonight. Uh, I know there's been a lot of other projects and basically in since we're trying to condense the time frame here, I, I don't think that there's much to discuss beyond what Sarah's already shown. If the, the staff is uh, in favor of the project. I'm happy to answer any questions on the design, but um, she mentioned the, the primary materials and we put together essentially everything for the presentation. And I've been working with Sarah personally for the last couple of months going through these. So um, I don't know that there's much else that we really have to present. You've seen the elevations and some of the renderings. Um, we we're just trying to make a neutral response to the historic context was our main focus. Any questions of the applicant? All right, then we'll open this up to the public hearing. Anyone from the public wishes to speak? And we do have that one um, email from the neighbor. No one from the public? Um, Michaela, anyone? No, ma'am. Thanks. All right. No gaps. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, we will close the public portion of this and uh, commissioners discuss or make a motion. A uh, couple of comments. One is that I appreciate how the applicant, applicant's architect has provided us with a nice uh, streetscape showing the proposed building in context with the other structures on the street, helps us understand mm -hmm. the scale of it. Um, I also appreciate how they've dealt with the garage, making it a stacked one car in front of the other, trying to reduce the, the visibility of that garage facade, which a less deft design might have proposed as a conventional two wide garage door. I think the, the applicant and the architect have done a fine job of setting this house into the neighborhood and the site uh, and that the uh, special exceptions that they are requesting seem appropriate and i would encourage uh, approval any other commissioner wish to speak i i very much agree with what kenton just said i think the the, the building uses the site very well and and I do appreciate just just as you say the you know the, the single door on the garage rather than the double, I think they'll work it out between themselves. I you know Kenton, if if you're ready to to uh, to make a, a motion, I, I I can or I'll certainly second it. Um, I can do that. One one thing I'd add, I it, it's not really ours to to uh, decide on, but only concern I'd have is the two-story expanse of glass facing west on that rear facade. I think they might have some heat gain uh, <laughs> challenges, but they can work that out. So that said. Penton, can I just ask a quick question? Oh, of course. Um, I just wanted to ask staff, I, for the setback exception in my past year in the commission, I can't remember this, making a setback a special exception for like six feet into the setback requirement like this one before does anyone on staff that's on the call have any examples of when that's been done before that i could maybe just think of as a reference for something like this do you are you speaking of kind of that that amount of an increase into the setback rather than just one or two feet which seems more more common yes um, I, 
I don't know that I can think of any of it necessarily have been that much. I think one of the things to think about in this particular case is that the zoning district requires the 10 feet on each side for single family structures. Um, and if they were in um, an arm of 35 district or an arm of 30 district, both of those are which are lower intensity or in single family zoning districts, the setback requirement would be four feet or 10 feet. And so I think it's really just trying to, um, I, I was at least looking at it from that perspective where if this had been a different zoning district that would have been seen as something that was, um, would have met the setbacks. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah, that's helpful. Um, right, I have then. a question for the applicant, just really, really, really quickly and really a minor thing. Um, there's some inconsistency in terms of the color that's shown for the, the cementitious stucco. Um, in some renderings, it seems to be more of a buttery beige. Um, in others, it's more of a bright white. Um, can we get some clarification on what exactly the intention is? Yeah, I believe we were trying to make it more of a light white, maybe light gray at the most. I mean, more of a contrasting material to what we have on the front, but um, not necessarily beige. We kind of have this more muted palette so far for this project. Okay, thank you. But Are we ready for a motion? Can I do it? Yes. Yeah, please, someone I've else for a motion. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, John. Okay, so my motion is based on the findings listed in the staff report, the information presented and input received during the public hearing. I move the historical I move that the historic landmark commission approve the request for a certificate of appropriateness for new construction of the residence and special exceptions for reduction in the north side yard setback and an increase in the front yard wall and fence height for the proposal at 245 North Almond Street as presented in PLNHLC 2021-00253 and PLNHLC 2021-00723 with the conditions listed in the staff report. And do we have a second? I can certainly second that. Discussion? Hearing no discussion, we shall move to a vote. All right, we'll start with Carlton. Aye. Michael. Aye. Mike. Aye. Victoria. Aye. John. Aye. Kenton. Aye. Aiden. Aye. The motion passes. Thank you to the applicant. And moving on. Thank you, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Yep, yep, yep. All right. Now we're moving on to something that's very interesting the national number eight on our agenda national register nomination for the mexican branch lds meeting house and multiple property documentation form historic latinx resources in utah 1776 to 1942 and this is um well it doesn't even have a case number i'm confused hmm, maybe we don't do that uh sarah is again going to uh, present this. I guess we don't need a case number. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I have the presenter control back again? Oh, sorry. Getting rusty. It's getting late. I'm going to try to keep this one quick for everyone. Despite the length of the information submitted, my presentation will be very brief. Oops, wrong one. Sorry. Did it work on? Not there yet. There we go. Thanks. So this is a request for review of a National Register nomination for the Mexican Branch LDS Meeting House, which is located at 800, I'm sorry, at 200 West, 800 South, and then also a review of the multiple property documentation form for Historic Latinx Resources in Utah 1776 to 1942. And as a certified local government, the HLC may review and make recommendations on proposed national register listings. Um, this is a historic photo of the front and west facade of the meeting house. 
The structure was built between 1948 and 1950 and served as a meeting house and community center until it was sold in 1981. It was the first Spanish speaking ward in Utah. And this is a historic photo of the east and north elevations. And this is a current photo of the front, which is the south elevation. It's taken from the west. And then this is our current photo of the front showing the eastern portion of the building. So the request is for the National Register listing for the meeting house, and it's being listed under Criterion A, its association with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of history. And then this review also includes the multiple property documentation form, which is a new submission. Um, and then this, as we've said before, is for historic Latinx resources in Utah, and the meeting house is proposed to be listed under the MPDF. Um, there are a few properties associated with the Latinx population in Utah that have been listed on the National Register, and the MPDF could provide for could provide a basis for the listing of additional properties. And so staff recommends that the Historic Landmark Commission um, forward a positive recommendation to the State Historic Preservation Office and National Park Service for the uh, listing of the Mexican branch LDS meeting house and then multiple also the multiple property documentation form for historic Latinx resources in Utah. And that is the my presentation. Are there questions? Uh, no is, questions. <laughs> this is great, Sarah. Who's the applicant? Um so the I believe the consultants that put together the nomination forms were from SOCA. Oh, okay. Awesome. Yeah, I'm glad to glad to see this and I'm happy to forward a positive recommendation. Um, do we have any public comments? Do we open up for a public? Yeah, comments? but I don't see anyone who wishes to speak. All right. Well, then we will close the public comment section and commissioners want to discuss or just make a motion. I just yeah, not 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 a motion. It's just the discussions. I had no idea that uh, yeah that this had the history that it has. Let's put it that way. It's amazing. I mean, I've driven by this this building hundreds of times, and right, and I, I'm pleased to see this. Great. Well, motion somebody. I can't access my drop. Aiden, or else I would. I've I've been having trouble accessing my Dropbox, I, or else I would be happy to. <laughs> Sorry. I can do it. Hang on. I if you guys like ever having a Dropbox issue, if it's easier to get on your web browser, you can go to our website, and all the same motion sheets and staff reports are there. Your Dropbox just has a functionality issue. Thank you, Michaela. That's helpful. just letting you know. Thank you. You're welcome. As a Latina, as a Latina on the commission, I'll go ahead and make this motion. <laughs> See, <Right. como> no. <laughs> Mike, I'm expecting you to second. <laughs> See, <como no. laughs> okay. Should we do it in Spanish? All right. Uh, based on the information in the memorandum provided by staff and the attached National Register uh, of Historic Places Registration Form, I find that the Mexican Branch LDS Meeting House located at 232 West 800 South and the Multiple Property Documentation Form Historic Latinx Resources in Utah, 1776 to 1942, appear to meet the National Register criteria, and I move that the Historic Landmark Commission forward a positive recommendation to the SHPO for the listing of the Mexican branch LDS meeting house and multiple property documentation form historic Latinx resources in Utah, 1776 to 1942. And Mike was Victoria, seconding that. Victoria, I'd be happy to second that without modification. All right, um, commissioners, any discussion? I had a question of uh, Michaela uh, or Sarah. Uh, is this the protocol in order to get on the national register as it has to come through us? Yes, as a certified yeah. local government, you can make a recommendation on it. But the SHPO doesn't have to follow our recommendation, right? Right, right, right. It's just like additional comments before it goes to the state board of history. Sweet. Oh. Okay, now I understand. Uh, any no. other discussion? Uh, one one question for Sarah, and and it has to do with 
I think this is great. I just want to make certain that that the applicant knows and understands that once they do this, that you know even stricter, uh, you know, scrutiny is, is going to be applied to any kind of changes that happen to to this mm -hmm. building one way or the other. And and Sarah, I'm assuming that that they know and understand this moving forward. I haven't talked with the um, the property owner of the meeting house, um, but I assume that since they've gone through the nomination form, the process of putting together the nomination form, that they are aware of, of that aspect of being listed on the National Register. Very good. Thank you. All right, then. Uh, any other discussion? Let's have a vote. Uh, let's start with Aiden. Aye. Kenton. Aye. John. Yes. Victoria. Yes. Mike. Yes. Michael. Aye. And Carlton. Aye. That's unanimous. Pass that on to the applicant. And now we are at the very end here of our meeting. And we are going to choose a chairperson and a vice chairperson. And what we want to do. First of all, I want to clarify um, that Victoria's uh, term is up as of September, and she's in a kind of a gray zone because she's also running for public office, so we don't know what's going to happen. So it's still okay for her to be voting, um, but um, I just wanted to make everybody really clear on this, that everything we've been doing is kosher uh, tonight as far as voting. Um, uh, does the chairperson want to stay and vice chairperson want to stay? Uh, it's a one year term. I know that Mike has been serving as vice chair for like a year and a half. And in most organizations I'm aware of, you usually move up from vice chair to chair. So um, what, what do we all think here? Who wants to play? Mike, are you willing to step up to chair? Uh, as Can long I... as you support, as long as you support me, Kevin, I, Kevin, uh, Kenton, I'd be happy to do that. Anybody have any other suggestions? So, if we have Mike as chair, uh, who would be vice chair? I assumed you were it? auditioning for it, Babs. <laughs> <laughs> you beat me to that one, Sean. Uh, that's funny. Um, I'd be glad to do it. It's no big deal. Uh, okay, uh, any other people wanting to jump in or are we good with that? All right, let's go ahead and uh, just have a, I don't know if we need to have a vote, but sure, let's have a vote for Mike as chair for the next year and me as vice chair and we'll cover each other and go from there. So what did I just do with my little important piece of paper? Here we go here. All right, Carlton. Aye. Michael. Aye. Mike. Aye. Victoria. Aye. John. Aye. Kenton. Aye. Aiden. Aiden. Oh, I said aye. Sorry about that. Okay, great. All right. Well, then that's what's happening. We are done with our meeting tonight, people, and you did a very good job, I must say. <laughs> yeah, welcome, Michael. Thank you, Would you like to have you with us. Uh, yay. Thank you. Yeah, nice to meet everyone virtually, at least. And good luck to Victoria. Go, Victoria. What are you running for, Victoria? City Council. District oh, one, great. City Council. What district? District 1, Rose Park. Cool. Good luck. Thank you. Yay. All right. I just got my ballot in the mail for my district. Uh, and we now have that weighted voting. But oh, I don't yeah. want to, I'm not going to vote for anybody else. I just want my person. <laughs> So, <laughs> <laughs> no wait there. All right, our next meeting, uh, uh, staff, when is our next meeting? Uh, what's the date? November 4th. 4th. Okay, November 4th. Remember that first Thursday, always the first Thursday. Right. Well, except this time. Um, and do we, <laughs> do we have one in December? Yes, we do. Okay. Well, you know, some people have, you know, first Thursday would be the second. So uh, that would be December 2nd. Yep. So that's what we look forward to. All right, everybody have a good month and Thanks. we'll see you next month. Thanks. Thank staff. you. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.